All Religions Are One by William Blake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness. The Argument As the true method of knowledge is experiment, the true faculty of knowing must be the faculty which experiences this faculty i treat of first principle that the poetic genius is the true man and that the body or outward form of man is derived from the poetic genius likewise that the forms of all things are derived from their genius which by the ancients was called an angel and spirit and demon second principle as all men are alike in outward form so and with the same infinite variety are all alike in the poetic genius third principle no man can think write or speak from his heart but he must intend truth thus all sects of philosophy are from the poetic genius adapted to the weaknesses of every individual principle four as none by travelling over known lands can find out the unknown so from already acquired knowledge man cannot acquire more therefore an universal poetic genius exists principle five the religions of all nations are derived from each nation's different reception of the poetic genius which is everywhere called the spirit of prophecy principle six the jewish and christian testaments are an original derivation from the poetic genius this is necessary from the confined nature of bodily sensation seventh principle as all men are alike though infinitely various so all religions and as all similars have one source the true man is the source he being the poetic genius end of all religions are one by william blake Appropriate Clothes for the High School Girl by Virginia M. Alexander This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appropriate Clothes for the High School Girl from College Bulletin, number 74, February 1, 1920. College of Industrial Arts, the State College for Women, Denton, Texas by virginia m alexander director department of fine and applied art someone asked recently why all this agitation on the subject of high school girls dress interest in this subject has certainly increased during the last several years and the high school girl herself is directly responsible for this interest it has been said that no great evil exists but contains the seeds of its own cure the costumes worn to school by the high school girls of our country have been gradually going from bad to worse with the years. Mothers and teachers have striven to do what they could to correct matters, but not until the girls themselves realized that this great weakness existed, and they resolved to seek a cure, were real results noticeable. The representative high school girls of our country are making a stand for good taste and democracy in the clothes they wear to school. This little bulletin is published with the hope that its suggestions may be of value to those students who truly desire to raise the standards of dress among the girls of their school. Many a girl feels, when she first enters high school, that she is a child no longer. She has suddenly become a woman, and she must demonstrate this fact to the world immediately by her clothes. Gingham dresses, middies, and low heel shoes are scorned as belonging to the days that are gone. Hair, once lovely for its natural beauty and simplicity, takes on fearful and wonderful lines. French heels only are to be considered, and a georgette blouse with elaborate camisole or a silk dress is an absolute necessity. With these acquisitions, our young lady is ready for her new undertaking. Could she possibly make a greater mistake? The schoolroom is not a style show, nor a social function but it is a busy workshop where material is to be assembled from which to build a life in a truly good high school of all places a student must do or die 
and there is no time here to be wasted on thoughts of frills and furbelows. Schoolroom walls and blackboards do not make consistent backgrounds for party clothes. In the past, the high school girl who was considered well-dressed by her associates was the one who was elaborately dressed. Now, since the girls of our country are interested in all the big world issues of the day and have taken efficiency as their watchword, the girl who is a leader is the girl who can do, not the girl who can dress. One of the surest tests of good judgment and refinement in a girl is her selection of clothes. The overdressed girl does not belong to the wealthiest and most cultured families as a rule. She is often striving to attain a social goal not yet realized, and the schoolroom and the street offer her only opportunities to show her fine feathers. Suggestions for the school dress If a girl should not wear fanciful clothes to school, just what, then, should she wear? In a general way, I will answer that question. A high school girl should wear dresses made of good, substantial material, appropriate for its wearing quality and interesting for its color and texture. These dresses should be made on lines becoming to the individual girl who is to wear the dress, and at the same time designed so that they will stand the wear and tear to which they will be subjected. Dangling tassels, sashes, and fluffy ruffles divert the attention of both the wearer and the observer, and by their very inappropriateness make the owner conspicuous. Above all, the school dress, which is a work dress, should allow the wearer free use of her limbs and muscles, and should promote her general good health. A schoolgirl in a dress built on the lines of a Peter Thompson or Hofflin suit with proper accessories in the way of shoes, stockings, and coiffure has much more style than her little sister in georgette or velvet. This type of suit is becoming to almost any girl as the collar, tie, and belt may be varied to suit each individual, and the design has become almost as staple as flour and sugar in the pantry. As a result, these dresses, made of good material, may be worn for several years without going out of style. Ready-made suits of this type are quite expensive, but patterns are easily secured, and any one who sews may make a successful garment, if a little care is exercised. Gingham, linen, and percale dresses built on simple lines, so that they may be laundered without becoming stretched and misshapen, are always satisfactory and pleasing. In cold weather, serge and tricotine make splendid but expensive substitutes for the washable materials. The dress with a washable underblouse. The linen or serge jumper dress made with a washable underblouse is a most satisfactory garment for the school dress. It is not only utilitarian, but it is also comfortable and attractive on account of its many possible variations. It is becoming to almost all types of girls from the very young girl, often found in the first year of high school, to the dignified senior. The dress proper, built on simple lines, will stand hard wear, and the fact that the underblouse may be laundered or changed will give freshness and variety to the costume. The very young girl who has not learned to care successfully for her wristbands will find this feature most valuable. In warm climates or overheated schoolrooms, the light weight of the underblouse will prove very comfortable. This dress, made of wool, may be worn quite late in the spring, and a silk blouse will be the most useful for the winter months. Made of gingham or linen, the dress will be a valuable asset in the summer wardrobe, particularly in the South. Georgette crepe is not an appropriate material for this undergarment, or for any other school garment. Its perishable nature and its transparency make it prohibited for the schoolroom. A very transparent outer garment demands a most carefully selected undergarment, and more often than not, this care is not wisely exercised by the wearer. A white shirtwaist and dark skirt is a very utilitarian combination, but from an art standpoint it is not considered good design. For a costume to possess art quality it must have unity. The wearer and her clothes should create an impression of oneness. The sudden change at the waistline from a light waist to a dark skirt cuts the figure into two parts, destroying this much desired quality of unity. The proper use of line about the face. The truly well-dressed girl, and the one who displays good judgment, is not the girl who slavishly adopts the new styles and fads of the day, regardless of whether they are becoming to her individually or not. This applies also to the way she dresses her hair. There is no part of a toilet that influences the effect of the whole more than the hair. The most becoming gown fails in its function if the hair is tousled or dressed unbecomingly. 
many girls fail to realize how they may overcome some of nature's faults and shortcomings and how they may counteract the effect of bad features and proportions by the correct use of line when dressing the hair if earmuffs become stylish the little round-faced girl who knows nothing of art or design as related to herself must bulge her hair over her ears whether it makes a full moon of her face or not girls should dress in style but styles should be modified to suit each individual the hair is a frame for the face the delicate blonde and the strenuous athletic brunette may no more wear the same coiffure than they may safely wear the same colors a miniature and an oil painting would certainly not be framed alike the slender girl with a narrow face and thin neck should be most careful with the use of line around her face hair combed in on the cheeks and high and back from the forehead will make more evident her slenderness a hard neckline or chains and ties repeating the point of her chin will make it appear more angular soft flowing lines in the hair worn low on the forehead and back from the cheeks should be adopted the round-faced girl should conscientiously avoid coiffures which broaden the proportions of her face also necklines and beads that repeat the curve of her chin suggestions for the stout figure a girl may not only improve the appearance of her face and head by the proper use of line but she may do wonders with her figure as well if she knows how to properly design her dresses a dress wonderfully becoming to a slender sylph-like girl may become a tragedy on her plump classmate every girl should understand her physical makeup as thoroughly as she does her disposition with its strong points and its weaknesses she should know the kind of line she may wear successfully in her dresses and the colors that are most becoming to her and the types of materials most suitable for her the stout girl should carefully avoid a design in a dress that is too cut up or complicated tunics and less long and scant are unfortunate usually and the interest created by trimming about the waistline or elaborate belts should never be indulged in by the stout girl length producing lines should always be planned and light or colored collars should always be designed so that interest will not be created out toward the sides of the figure creating width but down the center front instead contrasting shoes and stockings not only cut from the height of the figure but help to accent the feet and ankles of the wearer the girl who wears white shoes with her dark dress states by so doing that she considers her feet well worth public consideration contrasting materials for sleeves or elaborate cuffs or pockets will add width to any figure the designs in the accompanying illustration are most suitable for the older schoolgirl when made up of wool or linen materials i may safely recommend this type of line in design for the girl of superfluous weight plaid and figured materials our stores in the early spring and summer show such fascinating plaid and figured materials that i feel their use should be considered almost everyone has fallen a victim to a wonderfully colored plaid on display to discover later that buying a plaid is a much simpler matter than making it into a dress plaids are fatal for stout people area is the impression always created by them and unless the pattern is very small and the colors very soft and indefinite they should be reserved for the use of children and young girls there is no colored costume that will make a woman more conspicuous than one made of a large black and white plaid material in selecting a pattern for a girl's plaid dress care should be used to secure one with as few seams as possible every seam is a danger zone only persons with great poise and power of concentration if they notice their surroundings at all will be able to remain unaffected by a conspicuous seam when the plaids don't hit some plaids are designed so that it is very difficult to match the pattern in the seams of the skirt or a stretch selvage will add to the difficulty a gored skirt pattern making bias seams necessary should never be used for plaid material armholes and shoulder seams should be carefully planned a kimono sleeve simplifies the armhole problem but will not prove so satisfactory in a wash dress plain material either white or colored makes a happy combination with plaids or figured material the accompanying designs are particularly becoming to slender girls the wide soft belts and collars and the contrasting materials in the sleeves will seemingly add weight to slender young figures in planning tucks and band trimming for a skirt the result will be much more pleasing if variety is used in the width of the bands and the spaces between the bands 
appropriate clothes for the street. If the schoolroom is not an appropriate place for elaborate or fanciful clothes, surely the street is less so. The truly refined woman will never wear those things on the street that will make her conspicuous. Here all classes of people meet and mingle, supposedly on business bent, and the girl who appears in this public place in party clothes shows either very poor judgment, or that she is striving to attract public attention in the cheapest way possible. The most stylish girls seen in the city streets are those gowned in simple, well-made dresses or tailored suits. Hats, gloves, and shoes should be as carefully considered as the dress itself, and all should harmonize. A simple, dark silk dress is almost an essential for street wear in spring and summer, to replace the heavier suit or serge dress. Taffeta is an excellent material for this dress and makes a much cooler and more youthful dress than satin. A taffeta dress needs little trimming, if cut on interesting lines. Buttons, tucks, and plaited frills of the same material may be used most effectively. Little bits of hand embroidery or attractive light collar and cuff sets add much charm to this type of dress. Bright colors should not appear upon the street. A loud color attracts attention as successfully as a loud noise. Any dark, neutral color becoming to the wearer is well for the street dress. Wool mixtures and tweeds are particularly good for suits built on box or belted lines. Sport clothes will give the young girl a wonderful opportunity for the use of brilliant color. Dresses worn at home and for afternoon and evening functions permit the use of delicate colors, more elaborate trimming, and more perishable materials. Remember that a hat should serve a double function. It should act as a covering for the head, and its lines and color should enhance the attractiveness of the wearer. The Graduation Dress One of the most important events in the life of every girl is her graduation, and we shall here consider the dress worn by her when she has fulfilled all the requirements and that long-anticipated day arrives. This occasion is not one for splendor and show and the cue for the girl graduate is modesty and simplicity. She is not supposed to be a radiant queen bedecked for a festive occasion, but a charming young girl equipped and ready to begin life as a young woman. The simple and beautiful graduation dress of the past has assumed more elaborate proportions during recent years, until it has reached the point where the students themselves realize that a halt must be called. Georgettes, chiffons, and expensive nets have supplanted cotton weaves, and elaborate creations of lace and satin are not infrequent. The cost of the dress itself is increased by such expensive accessories as long white kid gloves, expensive slippers, and stockings. What is the girl whose parents possess only moderate means to do under these conditions? Perhaps she is graduating with honors. Is she to be embarrassed by having to play a Cinderella role by the side of her gorgeously attired classmates? Or shall she strain the family bank account and spend money for this ornate apparel that should be spent for the education or maintenance of other members of her family? Surely this is a time when the American girl may show her real spirit of democracy. Instead of selecting a handsome dress, which she often excuses by saying she wishes to use it afterwards for an evening dress, she will choose a really more charming one made of less expensive material, which will give her an opportunity to show her originality and make her personal charms more appreciated. In many high schools, the unfairness of an expensive graduation dress has been so much appreciated by the students that a price limit has been set for the graduation outfit, and the girl who violates this understanding is considered a real offender. The girls who have initiated this have been, in many cases, those girls who could best afford the expensive garments, and by such acts they have demonstrated that they are to make the splendid American women of the future who will lead in those movements that bring about the greatest good for the greatest number. I feel that organdy leads all other materials as desirable for the graduation dress. It is a trifle more expensive than some other possible materials, but its sheerness and crispness give character to the dress, making little trimming necessary. A dress of this material may be worn for quite a while, as a little pressing always revives its freshness. There are some qualities of flaxen that rival organdy as a desirable material, and a dress of this may be laundered with perfect safety. If lace is used on the graduation dress, do not sacrifice quality for quantity. A small amount of good lace skillfully used will make a much handsomer garment than one festooned with rows of a cheap quality, 
a self-trimmed organdy dress is very distinctive dainty little frills and pin tucks may be used in many interesting ways and they may be planned so as to be becoming to almost any figure daintiness should be the characteristic quality of the graduation dress it is always disappointing to see elaborate jewelry worn with these charming frocks in many cases the most valued possessions of the family have been collected for the occasion and this borrowed finery always makes a discordant note in the harmony of the young wearer's costume under no consideration substitute imitation jewelry for the genuine article patterns for these dresses may be secured at the college of industrial arts how to secure patterns of these dresses the college of industrial arts in its efforts to be of service to the girls and women of texas has made it possible for those desiring patterns of the graduation dresses illustrated in this bulletin to secure them through the department of extension at the college the original designs of these dresses were made by highly trained artists at the college whom we feel appreciate the particular needs of texas girls and women the patterns were cut from these original designs by the vogue pattern company of new york and are sold at thirty cents each their exact cost to the college an illustration material requirement and approximate cost are given with each pattern and they are cut in sizes fourteen sixteen and eighteen when ordering patterns state the number of the pattern and the size desired the quaint little design b820 will appeal to the young girl who likes a touch of originality in her clothes the becoming fichu and full skirt of this design seem to belong to the colonial days with powdered hair and patches this design created of organdy should cost from five dollars to eight dollars according to the material selected number b822 will prove more expensive on account of its lace trimming the approximate cost being from nine dollars to twelve dollars if interesting materials are chosen this loose peplum and snug ribbon girdle will make quite a distinctive costume becoming to stout figures the long-waisted design b824 is decidedly original and its dainty frills and ribbons appeal to young girls a dress may be made by this pattern of good materials for eight dollars design b826 shows a clever interpretation of the narrow skirt so popular today the tiny tucks and frills make a dainty and inexpensive trimming and the costume should cost from four dollars to six dollars number b828 demonstrates that vertical ruffles may be used successfully the dress is beautiful when sheer material is used and the ruffles are picotted and plated it should cost about six dollars the slender girl who is not too thin through the bust is charming in design b833 the organdy sash and flounced peplum are designed particularly for her from six dollars to eight dollars should buy the material for this dress lingerie for the graduation dress the garment worn directly under the graduation dress has much to do with the effect of the dress itself this garment should not be picked up at random but the fullness of its skirt and the design around the neck should be planned to suit the particular dress pattern selected underwear is to the dress what the foundation is to a house and it should be built just as skillfully it is impossible to secure a dainty graceful effect in a dress when it is worn with a clumsy petticoat styles change in underwear just as they do in dresses and the silhouette of the outer garment must decide what the lines of the under one shall be for the present styles soft yielding materials are absolutely necessary for underwear and few flounces should be used about the bottom of the skirt if the clinging effect around the ankles and knees is desired in the dress elaborate lace trimmings are neither in good taste nor stylish and handwork constitutes the decoration on many of the most attractive of these garments colored lingerie and bright colored ribbons should be worn only when the dress is not transparent bright pink and blue ribbons in a camisole or chemise will always look a bit garish when viewed through a thin blouse color has a magnetic attraction for the eye and wherever placed immediately attracts attention to that spot i am sure refined girls do not wish to invite public interest in their lingerie through the use of bright colors in their ribbons the most delicate tints are permissible but should be used only in small quantities white only should be used with the graduation dress since several petticoats are apt to prove clumsy great care must be exerted in selecting the material for this undergarment to avoid too much transparency when worn under the very sheer organdy dress corsets and posture 
the envelope chemise and knickerbockers are very comfortable undergarments and are quite popular with most young girls of today they may be made most attractive when soft dainty materials are used and the needlework is carefully executed these garments should be kept quite simple if lace is used it should be in limited quantities and of a kind that may be laundered often little bits of dainty feather stitching and hand embroidery will add individual charm to these undergarments style depends not only upon the proper selection of clothes but very largely upon the way these clothes are put on and worn many girls wearing beautiful clothes are decidedly not stylish their clothes look as though they had fallen upon their owners this is caused by the fact that the wearer does not carry herself well or has not good poise nothing is so vitally necessary for good health and good looks as good posture the slouchy humped over girl is unattractive enough when young but when she develops into a misshapen woman with superfluous flesh about the abdomen and shoulders the most skillful artist will be unable to disguise her deformities the girl with the debutante slouch or the one who sits in her corsets is rarely graceful the uncorseted figure is the popular one today but if corsets must be worn they should be most carefully selected fortunately the long unyielding coats of mail of several years ago are now rarely seen on girls and soft flexible girdles leaving the figure with its natural lines and grace have appeared as substitutes a well-shapen brassiere is often necessary with these low busted girdles a stylish girl has good poise this means that she stands well walks well carries her head high her shoulders back and looks the world in the face the clothes worn by this girl will take the correct swing shoes and feet all organizations and publications keenly interested in the welfare of young women are making a strenuous effort to produce better american feet and this is to be done directly through the shoes worn by our girls the y w c a during the war discovered that lack of endurance among girls could be traced back directly to misshapen feet flattened arches weak backs and abdominal muscles in almost every case these had been caused by wearing high heel shoes the human body is built and strung so that a person may walk and stand with natural grace and ease when the equilibrium of this delicate mechanism is disturbed by inserting a spindle heel directly under that point responsible for most of the human weight it is not surprising that physical ails result that must be carried through life a french or spindle heel is absolutely inconsistent for any occasion when walking or standing is to be done and is certainly not artistic when worn with a tailored dress or suit vanity gratified by a foot that seemingly is a bit smaller should not compensate for the loss of good health good sense natural grace and efficiency an elaborate evening dress may call for a higher heel than the one worn on the street but it will not excuse the wobbly spindle heels sold girls by many ruthless concerns end of appropriate clothes for the high school girl by virginia m alexander read by colleen mcmahon The Colossal Elephant of Coney Island from The Scientific American. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The reputation that the American people have long had of always doing everything on the grandest possible scale has lately received a very substantial confirmation in the two monuments that have recently been bestowed upon this country. The Washington Monument and the Statue of Liberty are the greatest works of art in height and magnitude that have been raised by the hands of man since the Tower of Babel. In addition to these, there is a third monument, facetiously styled the Eighth Wonder of the World, that has recently been raised in the neighborhood of New York, that for one reason deserves to be named in the same connection with the foregoing, namely, on account of its size. The colossal elephant at Coney Island has not been favored with much serious public attention owing to the fact principally that it is not an artistic work and secondly because it is the project and property of a stock company whose unexalted aim was to rear a structure that would serve not so much to elevate the public mind artistically nor to stand as a monument to some of our noted forefathers but rather to abstract the unwary dime from the inquisitive sightseer this fact and the grotesque nature and enormous size of the colossus has deprived it up to this time of much consideration 
but this should not deter us from inquiring how a building of such unique design and original construction was called into being. It was designed and built under the personal supervision of the architect Mr. J. Mason Kirby of Atlantic City, New Jersey. It was first intended to make an hotel, but later this idea was abandoned, and it was decided to construct the interior with the purpose of using it as an auditorium for concerts, etc., while the platform on the top, or the howda, as it is termed, would serve as an observatory. The elephant is constructed of wood throughout and is covered with sheet tin. The total length from the trunk to the back part of the hind legs is 150 feet. The platform of the howda is 88 feet from the ground, and the total height to top of crescent on flagpole is 150 feet. The height from ground to body, when standing immediately underneath, is 24 feet. The legs are 18 feet in diameter, and the two hind legs are provided with circular stairways leading to and from the rooms above. The first room reached in passing up the stairs is termed the stomach room, and is dignified with this title, not because it is provided with the wherewithal to cheer the inner man, but owing to its special location in the body of the beast. The different rooms in the animal are likewise christened after their particular location, as the thigh room, brain room, hip room, etc. The grand hall, or auditorium, is reached upon ascending the stairs, and this is found to be very spacious and airy, the ceiling being very high and slightly dome-shaped. A gallery passes all round the hall. At the further end of it, a flight of stairs leads to what forms, in fact, a continuation of the main hall, only on a higher plane. The main hall is 80 feet long and 32 feet wide, while the upper part of the main hall is 36 feet long and triangular in shape. There are 34 rooms in the structure in all, which are located principally between the walls of the hall and the outer walls of the structure. Most of them are quite small and are very extraordinary in shape, their walls conforming to the shape without of that particular section of the Colossus. The eyes which form the windows of two of these rooms are four feet in diameter. The tusks are 36 feet long and five feet eight inches in diameter. In laying the foundation of the structure, the builders met with some difficulty owing to the instability of the soil, it being simply a sandy beach. Piles were driven to a great depth, and a solid platform was raised on top of the piles and secured firmly thereon. A second platform, which was designed to bear the direct weight of the Colossus, was constructed above this, and was supported on vertical timbers strengthened by inclined braces reaching to the platform, with a view of resisting great lateral as well as great vertical strains. After the foundations were completed, work was commenced upon the visible portion of the building, the legs being the first point of attack. Yellow pine posts, 12 by 16 inches, were first raised above the platform, and, being bolted to the flooring beneath, were made self-supporting. Two posts, 42 feet long, were thus raised in each leg, and twelve smaller timbers placed in a circle so as to enclose the main posts were also bolted to the platform in a similar manner to form the outer wall of the leg. These timbers were joined at the top by connecting beams. Cranes were mounted on the platforms thus formed, to which the material was raised as the work progressed. The difficulties increased, however, with the work, and it became necessary to secure the services of the most skilled workmen. Not only was this so on account of the dizzy height that the structure attained, but to the necessity of conforming the construction to the peculiar emergencies that arose, it being requisite to form nearly all the parts on the spot under the immediate personal supervision of the architect. The weight of the structure is carried, as may be seen by the engraving, by five supports, the four legs and the trunk. Commencing at what is now the flooring of the main hall, trusses were raised on each side and at the two ends of the hall, and these trusses, the bottom cords corresponding with the floor and the top cords with the ceiling of the hall, constitute the principal support of the ribs. It will be seen from this that what might be termed an immense box girder was formed, the ends of which are supported by the front and hind legs respectively. The ribs weigh directly upon the upper cords at the four corners, but at other points the ribs bear away from the cords owing to the enlargement of the body under the howda. At these points it was necessary to extend the vertical and horizontal members of each truss from the wall and ceiling until they intersected with ribs. In addition to this, an arched rib, 
corresponding to the backbone is carried from the main support of the hind legs to the neck of the monster, where it bears indirectly upon the vertical support of the front legs. The ribs in the body of the colossus are forty in number, and each consists of six sections bolted firmly together. As they serve to give consistency and rigidity to the whole structure, they form an important element in its construction. They are about seven inches in width and are placed two feet apart, measuring from center to center. The head framing is similar in general construction to that of the body and is supported by the trunk and forward supports of the front legs. It is provided with twelve ribs. Great difficulty was experienced in raising the ears and adjusting them in position in the head. This was principally due to their enormous weight, some six tons each, and the great height to which they had to be raised, and the difficulty of securing such an enormous mass securely to drums which had been prepared to receive them in each side of the head. In addition to being bolted firmly in position at these points, iron rods were extended from the main trusses within through the ears at two points below the drum. The ears are some thirty-four feet long by twenty feet wide. The architect depends upon the enormous weight of the elephant and upon iron rods that pass from the trusses above through the legs and connect with the foundation platform to hold the colossus in its position. He has kindly furnished us with a few statistics that may be of interest. The colossus, he informs us, weighs about 100,000 tons. It contains 1,500,000 square feet of timber and 700 kegs of nails were consumed in its construction. In addition to this, seven tons of bolts were disposed of, and it required 35,000 square feet of tin to cover its surface. In size, it compares favorably with many of the large hotels and other structures in its neighborhood, and some idea of its magnitude may be had by comparing it with a jumbo, which is drawn in scale by its side, and which would find plenty of room for a promenade within one of the legs of the Colossus. End of The Colossal Elephant of Coney Island From Scientific American Knowledge, 1885 Page 333Fear and Trembling Introduction and Preparation by Soren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, published in 1843, translated by Lee Hollander in 1923. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Not only in the world of commerce, but also in the world of ideas, our age has arranged a regular clearance sale. Everything may be had at such absurdly low prices that very soon the question will arise whether anyone cares to bid. Every waiter, with a speculative turn who carefully marks the significant progress of modern philosophy, every lecturer in philosophy, every tutor, student, every sticker and quitter of philosophy, they are not content with doubting everything, but go right on. It might possibly be ill-timed and inopportune to ask them whither they are bound but it is no doubt polite and modest to take it for granted that they have doubted everything else it were a curious statement for them to make that they were proceeding onward so they have all of them completed that preliminary operation and it would seem with such ease that they do not think it necessary to waste a word about how they did it the fact is not even he who looked anxiously and with a troubled spirit for some little point of information ever found one, nor any instruction, nor even a little dietetic prescription as to how one is to accomplish this enormous task. But did not Descartes proceed in this fashion? Descartes, indeed that venerable humble honest thinker whose writings surely no one can read without deep emotion descartes did what he said and said what he did alas alas 
that is a mighty rare thing in our times but descartes as he says frequently enough never uttered doubts concerning his faith in our times as was remarked no one is content with faith but goes right on the question is to whither they are proceeding may be a silly question whereas it is a sign of urbanity and culture to assume that every one has faith to begin with for else it were a curious statement for them to make that they are proceeding further in the olden days it was different then faith was a task for a whole lifetime because it was held that proficiency in faith was not to be won within a few days or weeks hence when the tried patriarch felt his end approaching after having fought his battles and preserved his faith he was still young enough at heart not to have forgotten the fear and trembling which disciplined his youth and which the mature man has under control but which no one entirely outgrows except in so far as he succeeds in going on as early as possible the goal which these venerable men reached at last at that spot every one starts in our times in order to proceed further preparation there lived a man who when a child had heard the beautiful bible story of how god tempted abraham and how he stood the test how he maintained his faith and against his expectations received his son back again as this man grew older he read this same story with ever greater admiration for now life had separated what had been united in the reverent simplicity of the child and the older he grew the more frequently his thoughts reverted to that story his enthusiasm waxed stronger and stronger and yet the story grew less and less clear to him finally he forgot everything else in thinking about it and his soul contained but one wish which was to behold abraham and but one longing which was to have been witness to that event his desire was not to see the beautiful lands of the orient and not the splendor of the promised land and not the reverent couple whose old age the lord had blessed with children and not the venerable figure of the aged patriarch and not the god-given vigorous youth of isaac it would have been the same to him if the event had come to pass on some barren heath but his wish was to have been with abraham on the three days journey when he rode with sorrow before him and with isaac at his side his wish was to have been present at the moment when abraham lifted up his eyes and saw mount moriah afar off to have been present at the moment when he left his asses behind and wended his way up to the mountain alone with isaac for the mind of this man was busy not with the delicate conceits of the imagination but rather with his shuddering thought the man we speak of was no thinker he felt no desire to go beyond his faith it seemed to him the most glorious fate to be remembered as the father of faith and a most enviable lot to be possessed of that faith even if no one knew it the man we speak of was no learned exegetist he did not even understand hebrew who knows but a knowledge of hebrew might have helped him to understand readily both the story and abraham one and god tempted abraham and said unto him take isaac thine only son whom thou lovest and go to the land moriah and sacrifice him there on a mountain which i shall show thee it was in the early morning abraham arose betimes and had his ass saddled he departed from his tent and isaac with him but sarah looked out of the window after them until they were out of sight silently they rode for three days but on the fourth morning abraham said not a word but lifted up his eyes and beheld mount moriah in the distance he left his servants behind 
and leading isaac by the hand he approached the mountain but abraham said to himself i shall surely conceal from isaac whither he is going he stood still he laid his hands on isaac's head to bless him and isaac bowed down to receive his blessing and abraham's aspect was fatherly his glance was mild his speech admonishing but isaac understood him not his soul would not rise to him he embraced abraham's knees he besought him at his feet he begged for his young life for his beautiful hopes he recalled the joy in abraham's house when he was born he reminded him of the sorrow and the loneliness that would be after him then did abraham raise up the youth and lead him by his hand and his words were full of consolation and admonishment but isaac understood him not he ascended mount moriah but isaac understood him not then abraham averted his face for a moment but when isaac looked again his father's countenance was changed his glance wild his aspect terrible he seized isaac and threw him to the ground and said thou foolish lad believest thou i am thy father an idol worshipper am i believest thou it is god's command nay but my pleasure then isaac trembled and cried out in his fear god in heaven have pity on me god of abraham show mercy to me i have no father on earth be thou my father but abraham said softly to himself father in heaven i thank thee better is it that he believes me in human than that he should lose his faith in thee when a child is to be weaned his mother blackens her breast for it were a pity if her breast should look sweet to him when he is not to have it then the child believes that her breast has changed but his mother is ever the same her glance is full of love and as tender as ever happy he who needed not worse means to wean his child two it was in the early morning abraham arose betimes and embraced sarah the bride of his old age and sarah kissed isaac who had taken the shame from her isaac her pride her hope for all coming generations then the twain rode silently along their way and abraham's glance was fastened on the ground before him until on the fourth day when he lifted up his eyes and beheld mount moriah in the distance but then his eyes again sought the ground without a word he put the faggots in order and bound isaac and without a word he unsheathed his knife then he beheld the ram god had chosen and sacrificed him and wended his way home from that day on abraham grew old he could not forget that god had required this of him isaac flourished as before but abraham's eye was darkened he saw happiness no more when a child has grown and is to be weaned his mother will in maidenly fashion conceal her breast then the child has a mother no longer happy the child who has lost not his mother in any other sense three it was in the early morning abraham arose betimes he kissed sarah the young mother and sarah kissed isaac her joy her delight for all times and abraham rode on his way lost in thought he was thinking of hagar and her son whom he had driven out into the wilderness he ascended mount moriah and he drew the knife it was a calm evening when abraham rode out alone and he rode to mount moriah there he cast himself down on his face and prayed to god to forgive him his sin in that he had been about to sacrifice his son isaac 
and in that the father had forgotten his duty to his son and yet oftener he rode in his lonely way but he found no rest he could not grasp that it was a sin that he had wanted to sacrifice to god his most precious possession him from whom he would most gladly have died many times but if it was a sin if he had not loved isaac thus then could he not grasp the possibility that he could be forgiven for what sin more terrible when the child is to be weaned the mother is not without sorrow that she and her child are to be separated more and more that the child who had first lain under her heart and afterwards at any rate rested at her breast is to be so near to her no more so they sorrow together for that brief while happy is he who kept his child so near to him and needed not to sorrow more four it was in the early morning all was ready for the journey in the house of abraham he bade farewell to sarah and eliezer his faithful servant accompanied him along the way for a little while they rode together in peace abraham and isaac until they came to mount moriah and abraham prepared everything for the sacrifice calmly and mildly but when his father turned aside in order to unsheath his knife isaac saw that abraham's left hand was knit in despair and that a trembling shook his frame but abraham drew forth the knife then they returned home again and sarah hastened to meet them but isaac had lost his faith no one in all the world ever said a word about this nor did isaac speak to any man concerning what he had seen and abraham suspected not that any one had seen it when the child is to be weaned his mother has the stronger food ready lest the child perish happy he who has in readiness this stronger food thus and in many similar ways thought the man whom i have mentioned about this event and every time he returned after a pilgrimage to mount moriah he sank down in weariness folding his hands and saying no one in truth was great as was abraham and who can understand him End of fear and trembling introduction and preparation by soren kierkegaard further remarks on the policy of lending bodleian printed books and manuscripts by henry w chandler m a this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org there are several reasons why it is in the highest degree improbable that i should take any part in the debate on the bodleian statute but i reserve the right to handle in my own fashion any arguments that may be used and to supplement if need be any facts or supposed facts that may be brought forward during the discussion those who are in favor of changing the whole character of the bodleian and who wish to convert it from a library of reference into a library of circulation do not seem to feel much confidence in the strength of their case at all events they have made no serious attempt to meet the facts and arguments with which they are confronted but show a disposition to wander off into side issues of little or no importance before examining the letters of mr sanday mr ellis and dr rost as far as i know the only advocates of lending that have yet ventured into print it may be well to add some further evidence on the lending system which was omitted from the remarks by inadvertence the advocates library is as we all know a lending library and in eighteen fifty two or thereabouts the librarian informed dr bandinel that they had already lost nearly seven thousand works in eighteen forty nine mr maitland told a committee of the house of commons that quote, 
all the ordinary readable books for which there is a great demand are now reduced into a state and condition so bad that it is perfectly disgraceful unquote. and he was of the opinion that quote, the only satisfactory and practical reform in the advocate's library would be to put an end to the circulation of the books unquote. mr panisi a splendid librarian and a man with a head on his shoulders addressed a string of queries to thirty-six large continental libraries and asked inter alia whether they lent their books whether those books were in consequence lost or damaged whether the practice was complained of and whether the readers were inconvenienced by it six libraries out of the thirty-six never lent under any circumstances whatever thirteen returned either no answer or no clear answer as to the consequence of the practice three the public library at basle the university library turin and st mark's venice reported quote, no inconvenience as resulting unquote. but the remaining fourteen told a very different tale from the royal library berlin quote, few books were lost unquote, but books were damaged at city library Bern, quote, books do certainly suffer unquote, and readers are inconvenienced at the royal library copenhagen quote, many inconveniences are the consequence of such a practice unquote. Quote, books are lost etc unquote. a very eloquent etc especially if it be compared with the evidence of malbeck the librarian there see remarks page fifty nine at the city library frankfurt quote, books are not entirely lost but are often damaged unquote. at the public library geneva quote, books are lost and damaged unquote. at the brera milan quote, generally speaking books are not injured unquote. but readers are inconvenienced at the national library of paris it is hoped that rules have been adopted which would quote, prevent the great losses and just complaints of the public unquote. i may parenthetically observe that forty years ago or more the losses in this one library were estimated at fifty thousand volumes at st genevieve quote, the principal is acknowledged to be liable to many abuses." Unquote. At the Mazarin Library, quote, the system is found very dangerous. Unquote. At the Library of the Institute, the practice was condemned as quote, highly pernicious and practically liable to the abuses implied in the question. Unquote. At the Ducal Library, Parma, books are not lost and quote, few slightly damaged. Unquote but readers complain of inconvenience at the imperial library prague quote, readers were inconvenienced unquote. and at wolfenbuttel quote, all the inconveniences mentioned in the question are the consequence of the system unquote. that is to say books were lost and damaged and readers were inconvenienced i have said that the answer returned from st mark's venice where lending on a very small scale prevailed was that no inconvenience was felt but it is well deserving to notice that the respondent continues thus quote, if librarians were asked all over the world and they would candidly answer the question one and all would deprecate the system of lending being liable to every one of the abuses mentioned in the question unquote. unfortunately librarians like other people will not always answer questions candidly there is plenty more evidence of this sort but what has been already adduced here and in the remarks is surely enough to prove the mischief inseparable from this silly practice even to the most obtuse of mankind here too is a very significant fact which ought to speak trumpet-tongued to the bodleian curators in eighteen twenty seven mr Kerich, the public librarian at cambridge possessed an arabic manuscript a history of the berbers which was in the strictest sense of the word unique in one sense all manuscripts are unique for no two are or can be exactly alike but mr kirich's book was the only known copy of the work in existence anywhere he was strongly urged to give or sell it to the university library over which he presided but he utterly declined to do either the one or the other because the cambridge library is a lending library few men he said know the value of manuscripts and he declared that there were only two libraries in england where his book would be open to the use of scholars and at the same time safe the british museum and the bodleian 
This manuscript now reposes on our shelves, and we got it simply and solely because in 1827, and for many years after, we still possessed common sense. Kerich would never have let us have this unique volume, had he supposed it possible that we should ever have been so forgetful of our duty as to lend Bodleian books. We might learn something from the Persians, who, as I was informed the other day, on what seemed to be very good authority, have a saying which runs thus, quote, The man who lends a book is a fool, but the man is a greater fool who returns a book that has been lent to him. Unquote. A fearful mixture of true with false doctrine. Now for the letters, and as Dr. Rost is a librarian, he shall have precedence. His epistle will be found in the Academy, March 5, 1887, and it is a real contribution to the facts of the case. It is reducible to two statements. 1. During nearly 18 years there have been from the India office, quote, thousands of loans, unquote, and, quote, there has not been a single loss to record, unquote. In February 1887, there were, quote, 337 Oriental manuscripts out on loan, 47 of which are in the hands of scholars in India, unquote. 2. Quote, numerous editions of texts and other works based on our collections of manuscripts would either have been impossible or at least not possible to their actual extent except for the existing arrangement unquote. here we have lending on a truly gigantic and imperial scale quote, thousands of loans unquote, and quote, not a single loss unquote. nothing said however about damage and deterioration which must have been considerable. Still, quote, thousands of loans, unquote, and, quote, not a single loss, unquote, is a mighty strong fact, so strong indeed that Dr. Rost may be congratulated on a surprising run of luck. But his marvelous good fortune is no argument in favor of lending. It is rather an argument against it. A man has been known once in his life to throw double sixes four times running in a game of backgammon, no other player, however, who has seen this done need expect to do the like, for the chances against him, if we merely consider the single and simple chance, are more than a million and a half to one. Strictly, 1,679,615 to one. Dr. Rost has lent manuscripts thousands of times, and they have always come back safely, not perhaps quite as fresh and sound as they went out, but still they have come back. Let no other librarian expect that the fickle goddess will treat him with like favor. Consider for a moment the evidence produced above as to the experience of other lending libraries, and you will find it impossible to believe that the Bodleian can meet with luck so entirely exceptional as that which has befallen the India office. It is so uncanny that, were I Secretary of State for India, I should certainly follow the example of Polycrates and sacrifice something very valuable, only not a manuscript. The safest thing, however, would be to stop the hazardous practice of lending, and tempt fate no more. The second part of Dr. Rust's letter merely re-echoes an argument used by Mr. Sanday and Mr. Ellis. Mr. Sanday's letter is printed in the Oxford Magazine of February 23, 1887. He sees, quote, two great, if not fatal, flaws, unquote, in my argument against lending out books. They are, one, that I... Quote, look only at one of the uses of a manuscript, unquote. and two, that I quote, immensely underestimate the value of the work that has been done upon manuscripts in recent years. Unquote. I plead an emphatic not guilty to both these charges. On what evidence do they rest? As to the first, the evidence offered is that quote, my idea of a manuscript appears to be that it should exist beautifully occasionally inspected by a connoisseur who strolls down to the library purely for his own amusement and with no further result worth speaking of." Unquote. Then I am told that a great number of manuscripts are quote, valuable chiefly for their text, unquote. and that when quote, they have been collated and the collation thoroughly tested, their work in the world is to a great extent done. Unquote. Very good. Now let us dismiss as extraneous to the present question manuscripts which are, quote, works of art, unquote, and calligraphic or paleographical specimens or curiosities, 
and then let me ask whence my kindly opponent derives his information as to quote, my idea of a manuscript unquote. i'm curious to know because he certainly cannot have got it out of my remarks he must have other sources of information only i can assure him that he has been most woefully misled in short his notion of quote, my idea unquote, is wholly fictitious that a great number of manuscripts are quote, valuable chiefly for their text unquote, is a proposition so self-evidently true that it might have been thought difficult to find anyone out of a lunatic asylum who ever doubted it will mr sanday point out to me in anything i have ever written any passage which by any interpretation however forced could be made to say that the great proportion of manuscripts are valuable for much except their texts in the greatest libraries even in the bodleian the number of splendid manuscripts of manuscripts valuable as works of art or as paleographic monuments is comparatively small but let us suppose the fiction to be a fact let it be assumed that quote, my idea of a manuscript is that it should exist beautifully unquote. how would that be a flaw in the argument against lending bodleian books the argument to put it in its baldest form is that nothing that tends to damage a library ought to be done by those who really care for it but lending tends to damage a library ergo mino probatur whatever unnecessarily damages the books tends to damage a library lending does so ergo again whatever deters would-be benefactors from giving books tends to damage a library lending does so and so on and so on the remarks can be run out into mood and figure with no trouble at all how is this argument or any part of it vitiated if i were to say what i never have said that quote, a manuscript should exist beautifully unquote. let us clench the absurdity suppose i had been fool enough to say that no book should ever be looked at in the library for more than an hour a day even that would not vitiate the argument against lending books out of it have we forgotten in this once famous university what a contradictory proposition is have we as completely lost the art of clear disputation as we have forgotten the use of the rapier there are times when i think so come we now to the second flaw i quote, immensely underestimate the value of the work that has been done upon manuscripts in recent years unquote. suppose for a moment that i do how does that constitute a flaw in my argument it beats me altogether i cannot see it do not lend your books says the argument for five or six different reasons and i ask again with positive wonder in what way any of these reasons are contradicted even if i do underestimate the work that has been done on manuscripts what has the one thing to do with the other i could understand it if it were impossible to examine a manuscript in the library but that cannot be mr sanday's meaning or does he mean this if you do not let your manuscripts go out of the library and occasionally out of the country they will not be examined nor collated at all i hope that this is not his meaning for badly as i think of the state of learning here i have never thought so badly of it as this supposition would imply if after thirty years of constant quote, reform unquote, we are sunk so low that we neither can nor will use the treasures of the bodleian library ourselves why in that case i say let us give the whole of it away to some country where scholars are yet to be found a library in which no man works a library such as the bodleian is in the hands of men too ignorant or too idle to use it is dreadful to think of i however hope better of the place and i argued that we should not send our books out of the library because as one reason amongst others it would then be impossible for us to use those books in the library i wish to think of this university as still living and of its members as still lovers of learning for its own sake though i admit that this last effort cost me almost all the faith i possess but i trust that i have completely misunderstood the way in which my good-tempered critic would connect my underestimate of the work done on manuscripts with the argument against lending all this be it observed is on the supposition that i actually have underestimated that work this i do not admit to be the fact but whether i have or have not it in no way affects the argument against lending mr sanday's next point is that if we do not lend our books to foreigners foreigners will not lend their books to us which will greatly inconvenience english scholars and lastly that it is a great inconvenience not to be permitted to have bodleian printed books in our rooms quote, the purpose unquote, he says quote, with which one borrows books is mainly to complete a collection 
one has perhaps ten or twelve of the books one wants but just some two or three are needed which no other library but the bodleian can supply unquote. what does all this amount to why that it is a great convenience to have books and manuscripts out of the bodleian quis nagavit everybody admits it but the point and it is really astonishing how few people there seem to be nowadays who can see the point of anything the point is this which on the whole is the greater convenience to the greatest number of serious students letting books go out of the library or keeping them in it never to lend entails inconveniences lending also entails inconveniences on which side does the balance of inconvenience lie people feel as mr sanday confesses that he feels how convenient it is quote, to complete a collection unquote. they never for one moment consider that their convenience is another man's inconvenience provided they can get what they want they really seem to care not one farthing for anybody else in the universe it is almost needless to add that this remark does not apply to mr sanday if we did not send our books abroad it is certain that foreign libraries might and if they were wise would decline to lend us their books and a very good thing too it benefits us to visit foreign libraries and it will benefit foreigners to visit ours in these days of rapid and cheap locomotion there is less reason than ever for sending books racing about all over the world if you go to Samancas, to venice or to the public record office you may consult and copy records of spain of venice and of england for yourself if you had rather not go you can get attested copies of any document which you desire to have but you cannot borrow and it should be the same with all great libraries if a man wishes for a partial or a complete collation of a bodleian book or of a complete transcript he most certainly ought to be able to get it accurately done and i should hope that in this university he would get it done gratis though it would be no hardship or injustice if such work were charged for at a modest rate if a man unable to visit us is willing to pay for a transcript or collation and there is no one here able or willing to make it then there is a substantial grievance but in no seat of learning ought such a thing to be possible in any university that deserves the name and especially in a university so richly endowed as ours is there ought to be and if funds were not wasted there might be a number of keen-eyed men skilled in every ordinary language of europe and of asia able and willing for the mere love of learning to do this sort of work thoroughly well it should be the same in london it is shameful to us as englishmen considering what our eastern empire is that there should be the least difficulty in getting any manuscript properly transcribed or properly collated either here or at the india office let us reform ourselves in very deed and not in name only as quickly as may be although a university does not mean a place where the omne chible is either known or taught it is certain that such a university as oxford pretends to be and might have been ought to contain even amongst its college fellows men skilled in all but the most outlandish tongues mr ellis's letter appeared in the academy of february twenty sixth eighteen eighty seven it consists of two parts more or less intertwined that is to say of objections to opinions which he believes me to hold though i do not and of an attempt to justify the lending out of books the personal part i do not mean this in any disagreeable sense has been answered so far as it required an answer in the academy of march fifth eighteen eighty seven and need not be repeated here mr ellis thinks that the tone of my pamphlet quote, is to say the very least reactionary unquote, and he describes me as the exponent of quote, a reactionary movement against the study and use of manuscripts unquote. the pamphlet says in effect that the curators have for years past been doing a wrong thing and a thing for which they had no statutable warrant it gives reasons why the thing is both wrong and foolish and it begs the university to put a stop to the wrongdoing this mr ellis calls quote, reactionary unquote, a violent misuse of an adjective as it seems to me then he makes out entirely to his own satisfaction though hardly it is to be thought to that of his readers that i object to the presence of an undergraduate in the bodleian anybody who reads the remarks with ordinary attention will see that in the passage where alone the word occurs page forty six it is used to denote a species of the unlearned and surely no one will deny that it is rightly so used for not one undergraduate in five hundred could be properly described as learned 
but if any undergraduate is learned i have never objected to his presence in the library how could i object when i have said more than once that the bodleian was founded and endowed by learned men for learned men not a year ago i introduced to the library a very young cambridge man whom i firmly believed to be an undergraduate and I congratulated myself on having turned loose into that glorious place exactly the sort of person that Bodley, Laud, and Selden would have welcomed, for he was at once a scholar and a lover of books. It turned out that my young friend was not an undergraduate at all, but a recently made Bachelor of Arts. But that makes no difference as far as I am concerned. I believed him to be an undergraduate when I offered to be his sponsor. So much for the charge that I would exclude undergraduates from the Bodleian. I would exclude, just as boldly ordered, all unlearned people, and therefore almost all undergraduates. I would welcome all learned men, and women too, and therefore anyone, graduate or undergraduate, who is learned. Nor should I take, quote, learned, unquote, in a very strict sense. Mr. Ellis declares that he should regard the change in practice which I advocate, quote, not only with grave distrust, but with a quite lively resentment, as an outrage and desecration. Unquote, to the memory of the late mr cox i understand this rather tall talk and others do the same to mean that mr cox approved of the practice of lending books and manuscripts now i have uncommonly good authority for saying that mr cox viewed the lending system with as much disfavor as i do myself how could it have been otherwise mr cox was a librarian who knew his business and what the practice of such a library as the bodleian should be the curators, the greater number of whom were profoundly ignorant both of books and of book management, coerced him. He was obliged to yield. But I am assured that he detested their barbarism quite as much as I do. The rest of the letter merely puts forward the plea of convenience over again. And, like the rest, the writer does not see that neither I nor anybody else have ever questioned the convenience of the practice. I find that some readers of Mr. Ellis's letter suppose the sentences in inverted commas to be all mine, but that is not the case. Several of them are expressions which he supposes, wrongly enough, I should or might use. I have, for instance, nowhere objected to the nasty habit of biting your nails, though Mr. Ellis puts the objection into my mouth. So long as a man merely bites his own nails, I should say nothing, whatever I might think. It would of course be different if he were trying to bite my nails. Every member of convocation has a right to criticize the new statute, and therefore no apology need be made for the following remarks. For the first time in the history of the Bodleian, it is proposed plainly and clearly to invest the curators with the power to lend books. From the foundation of the library down to 1873, they had no such power, no such right. Nevertheless, from 1862, they did, as a matter of fact, lend manuscripts and printed books. It was their custom, their mos, to do so. On February 28, 1873, they resolved that they would, quote, proceed by statute to take power to order the lending out of books under certain restrictions, unquote. Now, no sane man resolves to, quote, take power, unquote, to do what he already has the right to do. This resolution, then, was a distinct confession that for years past the curators had been acting unstatutably, and that it is probable, perhaps certain, that the words secret most fuit in the extraordinary statute of 1873 were intended to cover and condone the illegal acts of the previous ten or eleven years, an intention completely frustrated by the unparalleled bad Latin in which that statute is expressed. Whether a permission, quote, to borrow books for learned men, unquote, conveys to the curators the power to lend them is very doubtful indeed. If it were not so, it is difficult to see why the curators applied for the statute now before us. Were any one to maintain that the curators have now no power to lend books, and that they never have had it since the library was founded, he would not find much difficulty in proving his case to the satisfaction of all reasonable beings. The present statute proposes to give them this power, though not in perfectly unobjectionable terms for it first allows them to lend manuscripts, and then declares that no rare book shall be lent without the consent of convocation. Now a manuscript is more than rare. It is unique, no two being exactly alike. There is an ambiguity here which will be found in practice to breed endless difficulties. Then again, who is to judge of the antiquity, rarity, and so forth of any book, printed or manuscript? 
either the curators must decide these questions for themselves or they must act on the judgment of the librarian knowing what it now knows is the university really prepared to say that the existing board shall decide such questions and if not is it ready to leave matters so complex and difficult to the judgment of any one man be he who he may lastly the librarian is permitted to lend books neither rare nor valuable and it is left to him alone to decide whether a given book is or is not rare or valuable to those ignorant of books it will seem easy enough to settle this question though it is one to frighten a man who does know something about them nothing is stranger than the sudden way in which some books become at first scarce and then totally disappear for nearly forty years i have been on the lookout for two english books which i read as a child one a book of voyages and travels the other a cheap edition of the arabian nights and never once in all that time have i had a chance of buying either they seem to have vanished one would have said without hesitation that they were not rare and certainly not valuable yet they are absolutely unprocurable but this is a technical matter which will hardly interest the congregation it is more to the point to insist that the rules for lending drawn up and approved by the curators should be revised and approved by convocation and that without its consent they shall neither be altered nor abrogated even so it will be impossible to prevent frightful mischief if the thoroughly bad principle of lending is affirmed is it not clear that the paris rule should be adopted that rule is that only duplicates of books neither rare nor valuable the exact words of the regulation are quoted in the remarks page forty three shall be lent but it is hoped that the university will follow the excellent example of the british museum the oriental congress has been moving heaven and earth to get the trustees to sanction the loan of oriental manuscripts quote, under proper guarantees unquote, and they have brought considerable pressure to bear but the trustees as well as the responsible officers in the museum have given the oriental congress its answer the authorities in great russell street know their business and they utterly decline to lend on any terms let us be as wise as they are if the present statute is passed no one can be so foolish as to suppose that it will be long obeyed or that it will not be soon relaxed the question really is between lending and not lending the lending if sanctioned in any form will at first be limited it will rapidly become unlimited a rat hole in a dike lets the water in at first in a drivel then in a stream finally away goes the dike and irreparable mischief is done so will it be with lending only that the dike which defends the bodleian will be bored in an indefinite number of places every borrower will act the part of a rat the borrower's list which this statute legalizes for the first time will soon embrace the name of every graduate in oxford it is so convenient to have the exact book you want in your own room yes unquestionably most convenient but what is the price you pay for this convenience a ruinous one you destroy the bodleian as a library of reference quote, once or twice a year unquote, says mr warren c academy march twelfth eighteen eighty seven quote, graduates like myself go up to oxford on a short visit with pages of references to verify anxious to see new or back numbers of the review celtique paleographic society publications etc it is both inconvenient and disappointing to be told as i have been told more than once that such and such a book is out on loan and cannot be had the inconvenience will become greater as the circle of privileged borrowers becomes larger unquote. this is the language of a student and the language of common sense the benefit of the reference library cannot be exaggerated and it must be clear to the meanest capacity that lending and deposit cannot possibly be combined it is not difficult to damage or destroy the usefulness of the bodleian and the statute on which we are now to vote is the first step downwards to lend books out of such a library as ours is an act opposed to the teachings of experience nor can it be said that the course which we are invited to take is one sanctioned by those who are eminent authorities on such a question the men who for years past have been persistently trying to force this fatal policy upon the university may be remarkable on more accounts than one yet they are assuredly not remarkable either for their acquaintance with books and libraries or for their knowledge of the bodleian to them it is merely a large library not essentially different from the london library or from Moody's, and they propose to treat it accordingly no mistake can be greater the bodleian is no ordinary library it is one of the wonders of the world and are we going to be such vandals as to sanction a practice which can only end in its destruction 
End of Further Remarks on the Policy of Lending Bodleian Printed Books and Manuscripts by Henry W. Chandler, M.A. Read by Donald Cummings. How to Pitch to Babe Ruth by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the editor. This is just a few items of information about a ball player that maybe you haven't never heard of him, so I will tell his name in the first paragraph, and his name is George Root, but they call him Babe on account of him being over six feet tall and pretty near as wide, and he is a great left-hand pitcher that don't pitch. Well, one day in May I had seen a whole lot of different sporting events that bores you to death, and the White Sox from Old Shy was playing in New York City, so I thought I needed a little more boring, and I went out to Polo's grounds and went down on the bench, and Manager Gleason was sitting there, and he says hello to me, but I just made a face at him, but he asked me to sit down a minute, and a boy named Wilkinson was going to pitch, and he was out there warming up, and finally he got warm and come into the bench, and Manager Gleason said, Come here and sit down a minute, Wilkie, as I want to talk to you. So Wilkie sat down, and Manager Gleason said to him, Say, listen, Wilkie, there's a man on this New York club named Root, and he isn't Cobb, and he isn't Speaker, or Sizzler, or Jackson. He's a bird that if you ever throw a ball where he can reach it, that ball won't be available for tomorrow's game. And baseballs cost as much money as other commodities nowadays. So if you don't mind, why, when this guy comes up there, don't pitch him nothing that he can lay his bat against it but roll the ball up there on the ground, and I will take the consequences. So Wilkie said, yes, sir. Well, they started this game in the first inning, and the White Sox didn't do nothing, and it comes the New York club's turns to get their innings, and they was two out, and Pip got on first base, and along come Ruth. The next I seen of that two-dollar ball was when it was floating over the right field bleachers. So when Wilkie come into the bench, Manager Gleason says, what did I tell you? And Wilkie said, I didn't mean to pitch it where it went. So the next time Babe come up, all he got was a three-base hit, because they were pitching more careful to him. Well, after a while, it come necessary to put in a pinch hitter for Wilkie, and little Dickie Kerr was sent in to finish the game. Manager Gleason didn't tell Dickie where to pitch to Babe, because Dickie's what you might call a old-timer. So Dickie pitched one at this bird's Adam's apple, and he hit it into the right field stand for another homer, as I have nicknamed him. Now this isn't no reflection on neither of these pitchers, which I hope is both friends of mine, but if I was managing a ball club in the American League, I would tell them how to pitch to this bird. I would stand on the mound and throw the first ball to first base, and the second ball to second base, and the third ball to third base, and then I would turn around and heave the fourth one out in right field, because he couldn't be in all those places at once, and further and more, there's a rule that makes a batter stand in the batter's box, and if a person pitches in that direction with this guy up, why all you can say about them is that they're a sucker. For instance, the last time the White Sox was here, a certain prominent Chicago baseball writer was sitting next to Colonel Houston that owns a chunk of the Yanks, and this George Ruth comes up. And the colonel says to him, How much will you bet that he don't crack one out of the park on this occasion? So the baseball writer says, What's the proper odds? So the colonel says, Well, I don't want to cheat you, and I will bet you a pint to court that he murders one. So the sucker took it, and the first ball was a foul that went into Mr. Shork's feet. And the next was a ball, and then the old boy took one right over the middle for another strike, and the next one hasn't yet been located but when last seen was soaring over a cigarette sign in right center. The most useless thing in the world when this guy's up there to bat is the opposing catcher, because if you can throw a ball past Mr. Ruth, why, it don't make no difference if it's catched or not, whereas if you try and throw one over the plate, it won't never get as far as the catcher. A couple of weeks ago, a guy come here with the St. Louis Brown and struck the babe out five times in one afternoon, and if he is smart, he will let that go down into posterity, and the next time they tell him it's his turn to pitch versus the New York club, he will say he has got a sore arm. End of 
How to Pitch to Babe Ruth Read by Rick Rodstrom Human Longevity by Joseph R. Buchanan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Human Longevity by Joseph R. Buchanan the possibility of long life illustrated in the first number of this journal may easily be corroborated by referring to numerous examples but the fact that the nobler qualities of human nature are the most efficient promoters of longevity is our most important lesson and it is illustrated by the superior longevity of women he is a misanthrope who does not recognize their superior virtue and he is a poor statesman who does not wish to see that virtue imparted to our political life and who does not recognize the importance of giving to woman the most perfect intellectual and industrial education that she may be self-supporting the british census shows that there are nine hundred and forty eight thousand more women than men in great britain the st james gazette says professor humphrey of cambridge has prepared a series of tables which contain some interesting information about centenarians of fifty-two persons whom he mentions at least eleven two males and nine females actually attained the age of one hundred others attained very nearly to a hundred years only one of the persons reached one hundred and eight years while one died at the alleged age of one hundred and six of the fifty-two persons thirty-six were women and sixteen men out of the thirty-six women twenty-six had been married and eleven had borne large families of the twenty-six who had been wives eight had married before they were twenty one at sixteen and two at seventeen twelve of the fifty-two centenarians were discovered to have been the eldest children of their parents this fact adds dr humphrey does not agree with popular notions that first children inherit a feebleness of constitution nor with the opinion of racing stables which is decidedly against the idea that firstlings are to be depended on for good performances on the course the centenarians generally regarded were of spare build gout and rheumatism were as a rule absent it seems says professor humphrey that the frame which is destined to great age needs no such prophylactics and engenders none of the peccant humours for which the finger joints as in gout may find a vent of the fifty-two aged people twenty-four only had no teeth the average number of teeth remaining being four or five long hours of sleep were notable among these old people the period of repose averaging nine hours while out-of-doors exercise in plenty and early rising are to be noted among the factors of a prolonged life one of the centenarians drank to excess on festive occasions another was a free beer drinker and drank like a fish during his whole life twelve had been total abstainers for life or nearly so and mostly all were small meat-eaters the oldest woman in austria at this time is magdalena ponza who is one hundred and twelve she was born at wittingau bohemia in seventeen seventy five when maria theresa sat on the austrian throne george the third had then been but fifteen years king of england louis the sixteenth who had ruled a little more than a twelvemonth in france was still in the heyday of power the independence of the united states of america had not yet been declared napoleon and arthur wellesley were as yet but six years old magdalena ponza retains full possession of her mental faculties unfortunately she can only speak the czech language and she can neither read nor write however she answers questions briskly enough through the youngest of her surviving grandchildren herself a woman of sixty magdalena ponza's age is authenticated by the outdoor relief certificate of the viennese municipality of american centenarians we have a number some of whom are still living harrisonville new jersey has two michael potter and bartholomew coles polly wilcox of hope valley rhode island celebrated her centennial last year so did jane wilcox of edgecombe maine while she had a sister ninety-four and a daughter eighty-one 
old auntie scroggins of forsyth county georgia is now one hundred and four years old and is still one of the most effective shouters of the methodist church to which she has belonged ninety-four years miss phoebe harrod of newburyport massachusetts celebrated her centennial last year she still takes a lively interest in passing events grandmother sarah drew at halifax celebrated her centennial a year ago her constant companion is an old bible which has been in the drew family for two hundred and fifty years mrs trifine bevans of danbury massachusetts held a lively centennial reception in the parlours of the west street church april the fourteenth eighteen eighty six her health hearing and speech were good and her step brisk she attributes her age and good health to good habits and allowing nothing to trouble or worry her she has always been a strict church member william waterman of oshkosh wisconsin is said to be one hundred and nine years old it is said he is a methodist uses liquor and tobacco and finds no fault with the world joseph o'neill of barnesville georgia might have been living still if he had not been frozen to death last winter at the age of one hundred and seven in a sudden blizzard he was a negro and had over two hundred descendants mrs elizabeth thomas of reading pennsylvania who had lived a century might be still living if she had not been killed last year while walking on the railroad track of those who overrun the century we might mention further simon harris who died in putman county indiana last january age one hundred and nine his memory was good to the last mrs elizabeth small relict of dr samuel small at lewiston maine had passed her hundredth birthday a few weeks when she died of apoplexy and mrs susan phillips of wilson creek north carolina died last year just as she finished her century nathan formerly slave of benjamin w bodie died last year in mississippi talbot county aged one hundred and seven christopher mann of independence missouri died last year aged one hundred and eleven the oldest of all and probably the oldest minister in the world is the rev thomas tennant of vineyard township arkansas an itinerant methodist preacher born in seventeen seventy one now in his one hundred and sixteenth year mr edward gentry told a more remarkable story at indianapolis last july he was at the governor's office and gentlemen were guessing at his age none supposed him over fifty but he said he had a son fifty-two years old and was himself seventy-eight he added my doctor has given me a fifty years longer lease on my life barring accidents my father is one hundred and twenty-eight and is still living my mother died at the age of one hundred and seventeen and her mother lived to the same age mr gentry is of english birth perhaps the best specimen of family health is that of the atkinson family of gloucester massachusetts nine children were born and all lived the first death in the family was a few weeks ago when john atkinson died aged eighty-four when he died the ages of the nine amounted to seven hundred and three years aunt dinah john the oldest indian in the onondaga reservation died in may eighteen eighty four aged one hundred and nine about ten years ago when governor seymour was about to make an address at an indian fair on the onondaga reservation aunt dinah walked upon the platform and asked to be introduced to him mr gardner said governor seymour this is aunt dinah who wants to become acquainted with you oh no him get acquainted with me aunt dinah explained me know him before he know anybody many years ago me go to pompey hill his father's grocery governor's father say my squaw very sick i ask what matter his father say go in and see for yourself he go into a room see a little papoose about a foot long then moving toward governor seymour and pointing her finger at him she said that papoose was you governor seymour born that night aunt dinah called frequently at mr seymour's and took especial delight in rocking the cradle and showering caresses in her native fashion upon the future governor of the state about three years ago she became blind and has since been kept at her home in the onondaga reservation she retained her faculties to the last her husband died thirty years ago 
her dying request was that the pagan ceremony be first observed and afterward the christian ritual what are we to reckon says the home journal as to the declining period of man's existence the point at which old age taps us on the shoulder and says it comes to keep us company varies with the individual it depends a great deal on circumstances which are hardly the same in any two cases some writers have said that a man is old at forty-five others have set down seventy as the normal standard dr john gardner who has written on longevity remarks long observation has convinced me that sixty-three is an age at which the majority of persons may be termed old and as a general rule we may adopt this as the epoch of the commencing decline of life suppose then we agree to call no man old till he is past sixty-three let us set down the names of some of the illustrious people of the world who have prolonged their days of usefulness after that age we shall make a table of them and begin it with those who have died at seventy that is to say with those in whom the springs of life have not stood still till they have had at least seven years of old age it will be found however to be far from exhaustive and every reader may find pleasure in adding to it from his own stock of information age at death seventy columbus lord chatham petrarch copernicus balanzani boerhaave gaul seventy one linnaeus seventy two charlemagne samuel richardson alan ramsay john locke necker seventy three charles darwin thorwaldson seventy four handel frederick the great dr jenner seventy five haydn dugald stuart seventy six bossuet seventy seven thomas telford sir joseph banks lord beaconsfield seventy eight galileo corneille seventy nine william harvey robert stevenson henry cavendish eighty plato wordsworth ralph waldo emerson kant tier william cullen eighty one buffon edward young sir edward cook lord palmerston eighty two arnaud eighty three wellington goethe victor hugo eighty four voltaire talleyrand sir william herschel eighty five cato the wise newton benjamin franklin jeremy bentham eighty six earl russell edmund haley carlyle eighty eight john wesley eighty nine michelangelo ninety sophocles ninety nine titian one hundred fontenelle it may be said that they were exceptional in living so long but if what the best authorities say to be true the exceptions ought to be the people who died young and not those who prolong their lives and carry on their work till they are old few of us may find ourselves like lord palmerston in our greatest figure at seventy or be able like Thiers, to rule france at eighty or have any spirit for playing the author like goethe and victor hugo when over eighty or for playing the musician like handel and haydn when over seventy but by good management we may do wonders the wisest men and the best have been conspicuous for working to the end not taking the least advantage of the leisure to which one might think they were entitled they have found their joy in pursuing labours which they believed useful either to themselves or to others john locke began a fourth letter on toleration only a few weeks before he died and the few pages in the posthumous volume ending in an unfinished sentence seem to have exhausted his remaining strength the fire of galileo's genius burned to the very end he was engaged in dictating to two of his disciples his latest theories on a favourite subject when the slow fever seized him and brought him to the grave sir edward cook spent the last six years of his life in revising and improving the works upon which his fame now rests john wesley only the year before he died wrote i am now an old man decayed from head to foot however blessed be god i do not slack my labours i can preach and write still arnaud one of the greatest of french theologians and philosophers retained says disraeli 
the vigour of his genius and the command of his pen to his last day and at the age of eighty-two was still the great arnaud it was he who when urged in his old age to rest from his labours exclaimed rest shall we not have the whole of eternity to rest in a healthy old age cannot be reached without the exercise of many virtues there must have been prudence self-denial and temperance at the very least according to the proverb he that would be long an old man must begin early to be one and the beginning early just means taking a great many precautions commonly neglected till it is too late more people would be found completing their pilgrimage at a late date if it were not that as a french writer puts it men do not usually die they kill themselves it is carelessness about the most ordinary rules of healthy living the enjoyment of old age may be looked on then as a reward and the aged may pride themselves on being heirs to a rich inheritance assigned to forethought and common sense many years are an honour they are an honour even in the case of the worldly and a great deal more so when life has been regulated by motives higher than any the world can show the hoary head says solomon is a crown of glory but he adds this qualification if it be found in the way of righteousness old people form a natural aristocracy and to be ranked among them may be recommended to all who have an ambition to close their lives well up in the world for a picture of an old man in this enviable state of mind take cornaro in his eighty-third year we find him congratulating himself that in all probability he had still a series of years to live in health and spirits and to enjoy this beautiful world which is indeed beautiful to those who know how to make it so even at ninety-five he wrote of himself as sound and hearty contented and cheerful at this age he says i enjoy at once two lives one terrestrial which i possess in fact and the other celestial which i possess in thought and this thought is equal to actual enjoyment when founded on things we are sure to attain as i am sure to attain that celestial life through the infinite mercy and goodness of god jeremy bentham who lived to be eighty-five retained to the last the fresh and cheerful temperament of a boy john wesley who died when he was eighty-eight also had a happy disposition i feel and grieve he said but by the grace of god i fret at nothing goethe who reached his eighty-third year is another good example then there is burhaver one of the most celebrated physicians of modern times who held that decent mirth is the salt of life indeed in the case of most old people we believe it will be found that cheerfulness is one of their leading characteristics the recent death of mr beecher who with his splendid constitution ought to have lived twenty years longer illustrates the principles of hygiene which he blindly disregarded for years he was threatened with the form of death that seized him and came near a fatal attack some years ago in chicago while delivering a lecture men of a strong animal nature hearty eaters and restless workers making great use of the brain are liable to such attacks if mr beecher had observed ordinary prudence and had a little scientific magnetic treatment he would never have had an apoplectic attack but he was commonplace in thought he went the old way and died as short-sighted men die he had read my anthropology and told me he kept it in his library but its thought did not enter into his life end of human longevity by joseph r buchanan i have been in hell or in search of prison knowledge by jeanie mcpherson from movie weekly august nineteenth nineteen twenty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org i have been in hell i have plumbed the utmost depths of human degradation I have seen women's souls stripped stark naked. I have been face to face with humanity at its worst. And I have met the most perfect kindness and sympathy it has ever been my lot to experience. I have been in jail. I did not visit the jail as a privileged guest. I went as a criminal serving a sentence. 
I was arrested, charged with simple larceny, tried, convicted, and sentenced to ten days in prison. I served three days and three nights of that sentence, three depressing days and three horrible nights. I wore the prison garb and ate, or tried to eat, the prison fare. And I know, from personal experience, just what prison hysteria is. I am a scenario writer. Complete knowledge of my subject is a requisite of my work. It was in search of this knowledge that I went to prison. I found it. In the photoplay that I am writing for Cecil B. DeMille's production in the near future, the chief feminine character is sentenced to prison for manslaughter. Manslaughter is the title of the story. The girl goes to prison a selfish egotist. She emerges completely changed. In order that I might understand the influences at work on this character during her prison stay, I, too, went to jail. When I decided to make this experiment, I selected the Detroit House of Correction as the institution that would best serve my purpose. The name is a misnomer. It is not a reform school. Instead, it is a penitentiary, a penitentiary that has the unique distinction of housing Michigan's federal feminine offenders of every type of crime, state prisoners, county prisoners, and the city of Detroit's municipal prisoners and doing all this in a fashion that compares favorably with the Middle Ages. There were several reasons for this choice. One was the sinister reputation of the institution. The second was that this is the only jail in the country where petty criminals are confined with those serving sentence for manslaughter. Another was that my family numbers among its friends, a man formerly prominent in the administration of the Detroit prison. This individual was the only person whom I took into my confidence. I wished to have his aid in securing my release should the experience become unbearable. With the exception of this man, no one connected with the experiment knew that I was not, in fact, Angel Brown. It was under this name that I operated when I stole a fur neck piece of nominal value from a woman of my family's acquaintance, who was living at the Hotel Statler. She reported her loss to the house detective and I was arrested before I had left the building. Hailed into court, I gave my name as Angel Brown from San Francisco, and was charged with simple larceny. I pleaded guilty to the charge and was sentenced to a fine of $10 or the alternative of 10 days in the Detroit House of Correction. On my statement that I did not have the money to pay the fine, I was turned over to a police officer with instructions to commit me to jail. Just at this point, all my plans were threatened by a big, fatherly Irish policeman who was detailed to conduct me to the prison. On our way down to the alley where the patrol wagon was to meet us, he said, This is your first time up, isn't it, little girl? I assured him that it was. Isn't there anyone you know who will put up the money and keep you out of jail? There was no one, I declared. I hate to see you go to that place. You wait right here. And he pushed me through a door into a bare waiting room on the level with the jail alley. I think I know a man who will lend us the money. My heart sank. After all my trouble to get into jail, my plans were about to be frustrated by the kind heart of a well-meaning policeman. My good-natured policeman soon returned with failure written all over his kindly features. His friend was unable to help. There was nothing else to do but load me into the Black Mariah and send me on my way. He had no suspicion that I was thanking Providence for his failure. I arrived at the jail late in the afternoon. My guardian turned me over to the chief matron, who knew me only as a thief, and the iron bars figuratively and literally closed behind me. There followed the formality of booking me. My name and sentence were the outstanding facts noted by the matron's secretary, a trustee serving a long term. After this, I was stripped to the skin and searched for narcotics. They even took down my hair and made a painstaking examination of it. When it came to selecting my prison garb, I was allowed to choose between long and short-sleeved underwear. I chose the long, for it was December and cold. With it went the faded gingham coverall, prison-made and drab. Despite the coldness of the weather, this garment had short sleeves. I selected my footwear from a great pile of shoes that occupied one corner of the matron's office. My choice fell upon a pair of dirty, misshapen things that fitted approximately, and had been splashed with paint and whitewash at one time in the recent past. From the office I was conducted by the trustee to the cell assigned to me. It was on the second tier of the cell block, which consisted of four tiers of twenty cells each, accommodations for eighty prisoners. 
and at the time of my incarceration the jail contained one hundred and forty women prisoners beds in the corridors supplied sleeping accommodations for those not assigned to cells white and black petty criminals and murderesses sleep eat and work side by side the cell into which i was ushered was without a window and measured approximately six feet in length six feet in height and not over five feet in width with a barred door one and a half feet in width most of this room was occupied by my bunk bearing a straw mattress blankets and prison made linen but no pillow this and a broken down chair tin wash basin and pitcher and pail were the sole furnishings i made my prison debut in the midst of the so-called recreation hour this is the period in late afternoon when the girls having finished a day's work in the shops are permitted to wander about the corridor-like space that surrounds the cell block itself this space is called the recreation room although there is no semblance of recreation facilities and was very cold two hard benches and a few straight kitchen chairs and one small table constituted the furnishings and i saw no evidence of any books or literature on the particular day that i arrived the girls were in the chapel of the prison viewing a motion picture the picture was a cheap industrial film showing the making of a newspaper and the panama canal badly made and badly photographed i think a strapping negro girl voiced the opinion of the majority when at the conclusion of the picture she said my god why don't they give us a love story once in a while i had heard the clever crooks never talked or made intimates and that the common criminals respected the mental superiority of those who could resist the temptation to gossip about anything and everything i was relying on this fact to carry me safely through the shoals of cross-examination on the part of my cellmates it was fortunate that i adopted this attitude i had hardly returned to my cell before a delegation of curious visitors dropped in to find out all about me and to get the latest news from the outside everyone wanted to know first of all where i came from every single one of them tremendously anxious to hear the news from their own home town since i claimed san francisco as my home i disappointed them all and it did disappoint them one girl speaking for herself spoke for them all when she demanded hell i thought she was from flint my refusal to talk won me immediate respect and when it was nosed around that i had been caught working the hotel statler single-handed i became a near heroine this statler detective system is known and feared by all criminals i learned my supposed consummate nerve won their respect but if i kept silent no one else did apparently everybody talked all the time calling loudly back and forth from cell to cell it is part of the hysteria of the place speech relieves the tension that they are all under consciously or unconsciously supper interrupted the cross-examination we filed into the long dining room and i faced my first prison meal long wooden tables and benches were the chief articles of furniture in this room someone with a sense of humor had posted a large sign at one end of the room commanding silence but the babble of voices and the clatter of granite ware dishes continued at fever heat throughout every meal supper consisted of a greasy soup that had soured two pieces of white bread without butter a mug of some mysterious black liquid erroneously named coffee i believe that i can eat any kind of food that is fit for human consumption but there are limits and this meal and its successors went beyond that limit supper over we arose on signal from the presiding matron and filed back into our cells as i entered mine the door banged shut behind me and locked thus i began my first night in jail for a time the hysterical racket that had gone on steadily since my advent continued when it subsided a little i threw myself on the bunk and amused myself by analyzing my emotions of the day eventually i dropped into a fitful sleep how long i slept i have no means of knowing but it could not have been more than a few hours i was awakened by a peculiar crawling sensation that meant but one thing vermin there was no more sleep for me that night wide-eyed i sat on the edge of my bunk and prayed for daylight i have heard and read much of the terrible feeling of being shut in buried alive and suffocated that prisoners undergo during their first night in prison but until the time of my own experience i believe it to be largely imaginative it is not it is the most real thing in the world i felt that the walls of my tiny windowless cell were slowly closing in on me i could not breathe the close air heavy with a sickening disinfectant seemed to strangle me 
there are no words to picture the suffocating horror that envelops one at this time hysteria succeeds reason i wanted to scream and beat my head against the stone walls of the cell anything to push them away only one tiny portion of my brain remains rational it was this tiny control center that kept me from going stark staring mad for the time at least in spite of this semi-control by four o'clock in the morning i was on the verge of panic partly in an effort to relieve the tension and partly in search of information regarding prison routine i feigned sickness and shouted for assistance i succeeded in attracting the attention of a trustee who was detailed to nurse service she made a sympathetic effort to diagnose my trouble but she was unable to render any real assistance at my insistence she summoned the night matron and i told my troubles to her she explained that the jail hospital was closed for the night that the chief matron was the only one who could open my cell door even for sickness and that this lady could never be disturbed until she reached her office at nine o'clock in the morning that meant if i was in danger of death i could go ahead and die without medical aid before nine a m the night matron even refused me a piece of paper to fan myself with throughout my feigned illness the neighboring prisoners kept up a perfect bombardment of encouragement and sympathy the nurse trustee was infinitely sympathetic but she was powerless to aid this excitement served to combat the evil atmosphere of the night but daylight seemed to be ages away and it was not until we were released about eight for breakfast that i succeeded in ridding myself of the hysterical feeling sometime between eight and eight thirty at the discretion of the matron we were freed from our cells en route to breakfast we made our toilettes such as they were inasmuch as toothbrushes toothpaste combs and soap were absolutely forbidden this was an exceedingly sketchy affair there were women in that prison who had not had a comb in their hair for months they kept it in place with string bits of hairpin or anything else that could be adopted to the purpose a trough into which all the prison filth is emptied by the prisoners also en route to breakfast does not add to one's grooming from this service we marched to the meal itself like its predecessor it was inedible as far as i was concerned at least the same two pieces of bread the same nameless black liquid or the alternative of bluish white milk and a watery fluid in which a few grains of some cereal were floating made up the menu i counted the cereal grains i think they were rice and found six in my dish breakfast over we marched to the shops we were set to work making cane and reed chair seats in other departments of this same shop brushes are made and the prison tailoring shop turns out the prison clothes and linen this work is done by the long-termers during work hours, although most of them eat and live together with the short-termers. At noon, we were marched back across the courtyard between the prison proper and the shop building for luncheon. White bread to the number of two slices, two slim weenies, sloppy cabbage, and the unbelievably bad coffee made up this repast. The weenies were a luxury. Usually, mealy-looking baked beans formed the main course of lunch meat was allowed once about every two days i learned the shops claimed our attention throughout the afternoon although the total amount of work done was negligible any petty criminal who works earnestly in the shop is promptly reprimanded by her sisters it sets a bad example and makes the prison authorities expect more of the other prisoners late in the afternoon we were herded from the shop back to the cell block and the so-called recreation hour and once again i was subjected to a severe grilling by my cellmates except that it had lost some of its terror the second night was a repetition of the first sleep was impossible through the night i heard the multitudinous sounds of many women confined in a tiny space quarreling back and forth or forming discordant screeching quartets in an effort to ward off as long as possible the spectre of the long dreary night I was told on good authority that the old-timers long ago had learned to pick the locks of their individual cells and many of them surreptitiously visited friends in other cells for purposes better guessed at than said two tiny windows on the wall opposite the cell block furnished the ventilation for this entire structure imagine one hundred and forty women living in a space ventilated by these two windows and overheated by badly placed steam pipes and you will be able to conjure up a picture that resembles the steam room of a turkish bath peopled with all the stenches of human existence made nauseating by the persistent odor of disinfectant during a lull in the noises i heard one woman a cell or two away instructing a neighbor in the art of crocheting they could not see each other 
but one had evidently secured crochet needles and material and the other was explaining how many stitches it would take per day to finish the collar for her baby back home by christmas by dawn i was more than satiated with my jail experience it seemed to me that another twenty-four hours of this would be impossible confident of my ability to reach my friend the prison official i survived the night after breakfast i sought a means of reaching this influential gentleman i learned that he had quarrelled with his superiors the previous day and forgetting about me resigned furthermore i would have been unable to reach him even if he had remained in his position to serve the full ten days without sleep or food was beyond my powers of endurance i began to plan frantically to achieve my release i bethought myself of my mother mrs o'neill who was living with my uncle i took counsel with the nurse who had been so sympathetic during my supposed illness without, however, telling her that my crime had been faked. She advised me to go to the matron and explain that I knew of a woman who might pay my fine. Perhaps the matron would notify her. I took an additional twenty-four hours to bring this about. The matron was skeptical, but I insisted that this kind lady had frequently befriended me in the past and might be prevailed upon to do so again. Needless to say, my mother had been disturbed by my continued absence she knew that i was in jail but she had expected me to return at the end of the first day by the third day she was nearly frantic when the matron phoned to say there was a girl in the house of correction who said she knew mrs o'neill and wanted her to pay the fine my mother never even waited to find out the name of the criminal she assured the matron that she would take care of the matter and hastened to the judge we have often wondered what the matron thought of the pair of us my release came at the close of the third day, almost seventy-two hours after my entrance. In that time I lost twelve pounds, and I was sick with hunger and loss of sleep. As I left, a group of fellow prisoners gathered at the door to wish me good luck. I shall never forget the picture they made. I call them my grey ghosts. Unkempt and drab, they waved me goodbye with a sincere wish that I might stay out and prosper. No one who has not had a similar experience can appreciate the outlook of the criminal serving sentence. To them, the world is reversed. Out of prison, we eulogize people in direct ratio to their lack of criminal ability. The criminal idealizes the master crook. The bigger the crime, the higher the social position of the criminal. That is the code of the underworld, and nowhere is the effect of this code more strikingly emphasized than in prison. One loses his perspective on crime. Even with my slender experience, I found myself adopting their viewpoint. If the atmosphere can do that to me in three days, think what it can do in months or years to the confirmed criminal. Of one thing I am convinced, most of the women serving in the Detroit House of Correction were cases of psychopathic care or, at least, expert medical attention. Many of them, I am convinced, could be returned to normal life by proper care and psychological treatment, not physical punishment but they can never return under the existing conditions. The effect of such an experience on a woman born and bred to a very different place in life is certain to be revolutionary. The girl in manslaughter leads a life of ease and self-gratification up to the time that she goes to prison. Most of the penitentiaries, and especially the women's prisons in New York State, are vastly better than the jail in which I suffered but this girl must go through that horrible first night in some intermediate city or county jail. That is one moment that is certain to exert a powerful influence upon her, and by comparison with this experience, the actual penitentiary will seem a paradise. I went in search of experience and I found it. I wouldn't go through the same experience again for any amount of money, but I wouldn't sell it for an even greater sum. End of I Have Been in Hell or In Search of Prison Knowledge by Jeannie McPherson Read by Colleen McMahon Leibniz's Critique of Locke on Human Understanding Excerpt by Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org it is unnecessary for us to give complete abstract of this notable book after the author himself has relieved us of this task 
since in the year sixteen eighty eight he prepared such an abstract for mr clare for insertion in his bibliothique universelle tome eight page forty nine and following before he gave it to the press in the year sixteen ninety it appeared first in london in folio and mr clare again published lengthy excerpts in the said bibliothique universelle tome seventeen page three ninety nine soon afterwards a new english edition appeared enlarged with many pieces and in particular with an entire chapter on identity and diversity which he treats in an exceedingly clear and excellent manner in the second edition mentioned locke acknowledges that he erred in the first edition when he assumed in accordance with the common view that what brings the will to any change of action in the course of arbitrary actions is the assurance of a much greater good for when he considered the matter more carefully he found that a present unrest which consists in desire or is constantly accompanied by the same places its limits on the will for the reasons for this view see book two chapter twenty one he will gladly however be informed of a better view some time after a third and in the year sixteen ninety nine a fourth edition appeared in which last edition locke either further explained his previous thoughts by many additions or supported them by wholly new grounds peter coste made his translation on the basis of this edition and when locke sent him his manuscript had worked upon the same for more than two years locke himself considered this translation a good one and presented his thanks accordingly so that consequently it must be the more welcome by a great deal of us to enumerate all the new editions would take too long hence we will content ourselves with the mention of the two most important which make two separate chapters of which the first is book two chapter thirty three and treats of the association of ideas locke says there is almost no one who does not find something in the opinions conclusions and actions of other people which seems to him fantastic and extravagant and is so in fact every one may have eyes keen-sighted enough to mark the least fault of this kind in the case of another if only it may be distinguished from his own and he himself may have sufficient understanding to condemn the same although he also may have in his own opinions and his own conduct the greatest errors of which he might be aware and of which were it not impossible he may yet with difficulty be convinced this arises he continues not merely from self-love although this passion has often a great part therein for one daily sees such people lying sick with the same disease who are otherwise skilful and whole enough to make nothing of their own merits this defect of reason is customarily ascribed to education and to the force of prejudice and this according to the common opinion not without cause but according to locke's statement this explanation reaches not to the root of the disease and does not show completely its origin and peculiarity he himself explains it as follows some of our ideas his own words have among themselves an exact correspondence and connection the obligation and highest perfection of our reason consists in the fact that it reveals such ideas and holds them together in the self-same unity and correspondence as that which is grounded in their particular nature there is besides this another bond of ideas which depends upon chance or custom so that the ideas which naturally are wholly unrelated become so exactly united in the minds a spirit of some men so that they can with difficulty be separated from one another they accompany one another constantly and one can no sooner present itself to the understanding intellectui than the others or indeed more of them so united are they appear also 
nor can they at all be separated from one another this association of ideas which the mind makes in itself either voluntarily or by chance is the sole source of the defect of which we now speak and as this strong union of ideas is not originally caused by nature it is for this reason wholly different in different persons namely according to their different inclinations education and self-interests that there are such associations of ideas which custom begets in the minds of most men no one according to locke's statement can doubt who with much earnestness considers himself and other people and to this cause can perhaps with convenience and reason be ascribed the greater part of those sympathies and antipathies which one finds among men and which work as strongly and produce as regular effects as if they were natural which fact then makes them to be called so although at first view they had no other origin than the chance connection of two ideas which the strength of the first impression or of an excessively great compliance so firmly united that they always thereafter remain together in the mind of the man as though only a single idea locke however in no respect denies that there are wholly natural antipathies which depend upon our original constitution and are born with us he believes however that with proper consideration man would recognize the most of those which have been regarded as natural as in the beginning caused by impressions which were not heeded whether they were suggested sufficiently early or through a ridiculous fancy locke notices incidentally the difference which may be made between natural and acquired antipathies so that those who have children or who must educate them may see how much heed they should take of this principle and with what care this disorderly union of ideas in the mind of the youth should be prevented he thereupon points out by some examples how such a union of ideas which are not of themselves united yet depend one upon another is sufficient to impede our moral and natural action yea more our notions themselves the ideas of goblins or of spirits agrees as little with darkness as with light if however a foolish maid instills and awakens these different ideas in the mind of a child as though they were connected with each other the child during his entire life will perhaps not be able to separate them from each other so that the darkness evermore will seem to him to be accompanied by these horrible ideas if any one has suffered a grievous wrong on account of another he thinks very often of the persons and the deeds and while he thus strongly or for a long time thinks thereupon he at the same time glues these two ideas together so firmly that he makes them almost one as it were and never remembers the person but that the wrong received also enters his head and while he can scarcely distinguish these two things he has just as much aversion for the one as for the other thence it comes locke adds that hatred arises from slight and worthless ideas and quarrels are taken up and continued in the world one of locke's friends was wholly cured of madness by a certain man through a very painful operation for which service he acknowledged himself under great obligation to him throughout his life as he was so circumstanced that he required from no one a greater service during his life reason or gratitude might suggest to him what they would yet he could never bear the sight of his surgeon for as the sight of him always brought again to mind the idea of the very great pain which he had been obliged to endure at his hands he could not endure this idea so violent was the impressions it produced in his mind many children hold their books which were the occasion hereto accountable for most of the ill treatment they endured at school and they unite these ideas so well that they regard a book with great disgust and all their life study and books cannot win their love 
because to them reading which might otherwise have greatly delighted them became a genuine torture an example notable for its singularity is the following which an eminent man who assured him he had himself seen it relates to locke a young man had learned to dance very prettily and perfectly there chanced to stand however in the hall where he first learned an old trunk the idea of which combined so imperceptibly with his turns and steps in the dance that although he could dance incomparably well in this hall he could do this only when the old trunk was there in other places however he could not dance at all unless the old trunk itself or one like it stood in its accustomed place the habitus intellectuals which are contracted through such association of ideas are as locke further informs us just as strong and numerous even though very little heeded supposing the ideas of being and matter were very strongly united either by education or by an excessively great application to these two ideas according as they are combined in the mind what notions and reasonings would they not produce concerning different spirits if a custom accepted from childhood up had united a form or figure with the idea of god into what absurdities would such a thought in the contemplation of deity not plunge us we shall no doubt find locke adds that it is nothing else than similar ill-grounded and unnatural combinations of ideas which break the path for the many conflicting sects in philosophy and religion for it is not to be supposed that each member of these different sects is willingly deceived and against his better knowledge and conscience rejects the truth demonstrated to him by clear evidence it is indeed certain that sometimes interest assists greatly in this sort of thing yet no one could affirm that it could captivate and lead astray whole societies so that they all none excepted should affirm plain and deliberate falsehoods for it must be that some at least do what others pretend to do namely seek truth sincerely therefore there must be something which blinds their understanding and hinders them from recognizing the falsehood of what they consider as pure and refined truth if we now investigate accurately what takes reason prisoner and darkens the understanding of otherwise sincere people we find that it is simply and solely some free ideas which properly speaking really have no bond among themselves but which by education custom and uninterrupted action on their part are so united in the mind that they can no more be separated and distinguished from one another than a single idea thence it comes locke continues that often the crudest things are taken for worthy opinions absurdities for demonstrations and intolerable and absurd results for strong and fluent reasonings end of leibniz's essay on locke's essay of human understanding excerpt by gottfried leibniz 1646 to 1716「Mental Telegraphy, again, by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have three or four curious incidents to tell about. They seem to come under the head of what I named Mental Telegraphy in a paper written seventeen years ago and published long afterwards. The paper entitled Mental Telegraphy, which originally appeared in Harper's Magazine for December 1893, is included in the volume entitled The American Claimant and Other Stories and Sketches. Several years ago I made a campaign on the platform with Mr. George W. Cable. In Montreal we were honored with a reception. It began at two in the afternoon in a long drawing-room in the Windsor Hotel. 
Mr. Cable and I stood at one end of this room, and the ladies and gentlemen entered it at the other end, crossed it at that end, then came up the long left side, shook hands with us, said a word or two, and passed on in the usual way. My sight is of the telescopic sort, and I presently recognized a familiar face among the throng of strangers drifting in at the distant door, and I said to myself, with surprise and high gratification, that is Mrs. R. I had forgotten that she was a Canadian. She had been a great friend of mine in Carson City, Nevada, in the early days. I had not seen her, or heard of her, for twenty years. I had not been thinking about her. There was nothing to suggest her to me, nothing to bring her to my mind. In fact, to me, she had long ago ceased to exist, and had disappeared from my consciousness. But I knew her instantly, and I saw her so clearly that I was able to note some of the particulars of her dress, and did note them, and they remained in my mind. I was impatient for her to come. In the midst of the hand-shakings I snatched glimpses of her and noted her progress with the slow-moving file across the end of the room. Then I saw her start up the side, and this gave me a full front view of her face. I saw her last when she was within twenty-five feet of me. For an hour I kept thinking she must still be in the room somewhere and would come at last, but I was disappointed. When I arrived in the lecture hall that evening, someone said, "'Come into the waiting room. There's a friend of yours there who wants to see you. You'll not be introduced. You are to do the recognizing, without help, if you can.' I said to myself, "'If it is Mrs. R., I shan't have any trouble.' There were perhaps ten ladies present, all seated. In the midst of them was Mrs. R., as I had expected. She was dressed exactly as she was when I had seen her in the afternoon. I went forward and shook hands with her and called her by name and said, I knew you the moment you appeared at the reception this afternoon. She looked surprised and said, But I was not at the reception. I have just arrived from Quebec and have not been in town an hour. It was my turn to be surprised now. I said, I can't help it. I give you my word of honor that it is as I say. I saw you at the reception, and you were dressed precisely as you are now. When they told me a moment ago that I should find a friend in this room, your image rose before me, dress and all, just as I had seen you at the reception. Those are the facts. She was not at the reception at all, nor anywhere near it. But I saw her there, nevertheless, and most clearly and unmistakably. To that I could make oath. How is one to explain this? I was not thinking of her at the time, had not thought of her for years. But she had been thinking of me, no doubt. Did her thoughts flit through the leagues of air to me, and bring with it that clear and pleasant vision of herself? I think so. That was and remains my sole experience in the matter of apparitions. I mean apparitions that come when one is ostensibly awake. I could have been asleep for a moment. The apparition could have been the creature of a dream. Still, that is nothing to the point. The feature of interest is the happening of the thing just at that time, instead of at an earlier or later time, which is argument that its origin lay in thought transference. My next incident will be set aside by most persons as being merely a coincidence, I suppose. Years ago I used to think sometimes of making a lecturing trip through the Antipodes and the borders of the Orient, but always gave up the idea, partly because of the great length of the journey, and partly because my wife could not well manage to go with me. Towards the end of last January that idea, after an interval of years, came suddenly into my head again, forcefully, too, and without any apparent reason. Whence came it? What suggested it? I will touch upon that presently. I was at that time where I am now, in Paris. I wrote at once to Henry M. Stanley, London, and asked him some questions about his Australian lecture tour and inquired who had conducted him, and what were the terms. After a day or two, 
His answer came. It began, The lecture agent for Australia and New Zealand is par excellence Mr. R. S. Smythe of Melbourne. He added his itinerary, terms, sea expenses, and some other matters, and advised me to write Mr. Smythe, which I did, February 3rd. I began my letter by saying in substance that while he did not know me personally, we had a mutual friend in Stanley, and that would answer for an introduction. Then I proposed my trip, and asked if he would give me the same terms which he had given Stanley. I mailed my letter to Mr. Smythe, February 6th, and three days later I got a letter from the selfsame Smythe dated Melbourne, December 17th. I would as soon have expected to get a letter from the late George Washington. The letter began somewhat as mine to him had begun, with a self-introduction. Dear Mr. Clemens, It is so long since Archibald Forbes and I spent that pleasant afternoon in your comfortable house at Hartford that you have probably quite forgotten the occasion. In the course of his letter this occurs. I am willing to give you here he named the terms which he had given Stanley, for an Antipodean tour to last, say, three months. Here was the single essential detail of my letter answered three days after I had mailed my inquiry. I might have saved myself the trouble and the postage, and a few years ago I would have done that very thing, for I would have argued that my sudden and strong impulse to write and ask some questions of a stranger on the underside of the globe meant that the impulse came from that stranger, and that he would answer my questions of his own motion if I would let him alone. Mr. Smythe's letter probably passed under my nose on its way to lose three weeks traveling to America and back, and gave me a whiff of its contents as it went along. Letters often act like that. Instead of the thought coming to you in an instant from Australia, the apparently unsentient letter imparts it to you as it glides invisibly past your elbow in the mailbag. Next incident. In the following month, March, I was in America. I spent a Sunday at Irvington-on-the-Hudson with Mr. John Brisbane Walker of the Cosmopolitan magazine. We came into New York next morning and went to the Century Club for luncheon. He said some praiseful things about the character of the club and the orderly serenity and pleasantness of its quarters, and asked if I had ever tried to acquire membership in it. I said I had not, and that New York clubs were a continuous expense to the country members without being of frequent use or benefit to them. "'And now I've got an idea,' said I. There's the Lotos, the first New York club I was ever a member of, my very earliest love in that line. I have been a member of it for considerably more than twenty years, yet have seldom had a chance to look in and see the boys. They turn gray and grow old while I am not watching, and my dues go on. I am going to Hartford this afternoon for a day or two. But as soon as I get back I will go to John Elderkin very privately and say, Remember the veteran and confer distinction upon him for the sake of old times. Make me an honorary member and abolish the tax. If you haven't any such thing as honorary membership, all the better. Create it for my honor and glory. That would be a great thing. I will go to John Elderkin as soon as I get back from Hartford. I took the last express that afternoon, first telegraphing Mr. F. G. Whitmore to come and see me next day. When he came, he asked, Did you get a letter from Mr. John Elderkin, secretary of the Lotos Club, before you left New York? Then it just missed you. If I had known you were coming, I would have kept it. It is beautiful and will make you proud. The board of directors, by unanimous vote, have made you a life member and squelched those dues, and you are to be on hand and receive your distinction on the night of the 30th, which is the 25th anniversary of the founding of the club, and it will not surprise me if they have some great times there. What put the honorary membership in my head that day in the Century Club, for I had never thought of it before? 
I don't know what brought the thought to me at that particular time instead of earlier, but I am well satisfied that it originated with the board of directors, and had been on its way to my brain through the air ever since the moment that saw their vote recorded. Another incident. I was in Hartford two or three days as a guest of the Reverend Joseph H. Twitchell. I have held the rank of honorary uncle to his children for a quarter of a century, and I went out with him in the trolley car to visit one of my nieces who is at Miss Porter's famous school in Farmington. The distance is eight or nine miles. On the way, talking, I illustrated something with an anecdote. This is the anecdote. Two years and a half ago I and the family arrived at Milan on our way to Rome and stopped at the Continental. After dinner I went below and took a seat in the stone-paved court where the customary lemon trees stand in the customary tubs, and said to myself, Now this is comfort, comfort and repose, and nobody to disturb it. I do not know anybody in Milan. Then a young gentleman stepped up and shook hands, which damaged my theory. He said in substance, "'You won't remember me, Mr. Clemens, but I remember you very well. I was a cadet at West Point when you and Reverend Joseph H. Twitchell came there some years ago and talked to us on a hundredth night. I am a lieutenant in the regular army now, and my name is H. I am in Europe, all alone, for a modest little tour. My regiment is in Arizona.' We became friendly and sociable, and in the course of the talk he told me of an adventure which had befallen him, about to this effect. I was at Bellagio, stopping at the big hotel there, and ten days ago I lost my letter of credit. I did not know what in the world to do. I was a stranger. I knew no one in Europe. I hadn't a penny in my pocket. I couldn't even send a telegram to London to get my lost letter replaced. My hotel bill was a week old and the presentation of it imminent, so imminent that it could happen at any moment now. I was so frightened that my wits seemed to leave me. I tramped and tramped back and forth like a crazy person. If anybody approached me, I hurried away, for no matter what a person looked like, I took him for the head waiter with the bill. I was at last in such a desperate state that I was ready to do any wild thing that promised even the shadow of help and so this is the insane thing that I did. I saw a family lunching at a small table on the veranda and recognized their nationality, Americans, father, mother, and several young daughters, young, tastefully dressed, and pretty, the rule with our people. I went straight there in my civilian costume, named my name, said I was a lieutenant in the army, and told my story and asked for help. What do you suppose the gentleman did? But you would not guess in twenty years. He took out a handful of gold coin and told me to help myself freely. That's what he did. The next morning the lieutenant told me his new letter of credit had arrived in the night, so we strolled to Cook's to draw money to pay back the benefactor with. We got it, and then went strolling through the great arcade. Presently he said, Yonder they are. Come and be introduced. I was introduced to the parents and the young ladies. Then we separated, and I never saw him or them any— Here we are at Farmington, said Twitchell, interrupting. We left the trolley car and tramped through the mud a hundred yards or so to the school, talking about the time we and Warner walked out there years ago and the pleasant time we had. We had a visit with my niece in the parlor, then started for the trolley again. Outside the house we encountered a double rank of twenty or thirty of Miss Porter's young ladies arriving from a walk, and we stood aside, ostensibly to let them have room to file past, but really to look at them. Presently one of them stepped out of the rank and said, "'You don't know me, Mr. Twitchell, but I know your daughter, and that gives me the privilege of shaking hands with you.' Then she put out her hand to me and said, and I wish to shake hands with you, too, Mr. Clemens. You don't remember me, but you were introduced to me in the arcade in Milan two years and a half ago by Lieutenant H. 
what had put that story into my head after all that stretch of time was it just the proximity of that young girl or was it merely an odd accident end of mental telegraphy again by mark twain read by thomas rose Of Truth by Francis Bacon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What is truth? said Jesting Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. Certainly there be that delight in giddiness, and count it a bondage to fix a belief affecting free will in thinking as well as in acting and though the sects of philosophers of that kind be gone yet there remain certain discoursing wits which are of the same veins though there be not so much blood in them as was in those of the ancients but it is not only the difficulty and labor which men take in finding out the truth nor again that when it is found it imposeth upon men's thoughts that doth bring lies in favor but a natural though corrupt love of the lie itself one of the later schools of the grecians examineth the matter and it is at a stand to think what should be in it that men should love lies where neither they make for pleasure as with the poets nor for advantage as with the merchants but for the lies sake but i cannot tell this same truth is a naked and open daylight that doth not show the masks and mummeries and triumphs of the world half so stately and daintily as candlelights truth may perhaps come to the price of a pearl that showeth best by day but it will not rise to the price of a diamond or a carbuncle that showeth best in varied lights a mixture of a lie doth ever add pleasure doth any man doubt that if there were taken out of men's minds vain opinions flattering hopes false valuations imaginations as one would and the like but it would leave the minds of a number of men poor shrunken things full of melancholy and indisposition and unpleasing to themselves one of the fathers in great severity called posi vinum de amonum because it fireth the imagination and yet it is but with the shadow of a lie but it is not the lie that passeth through the mind but the lie that sinketh in and settled in it that doth the hurt such as we spake of before but howsoever these things are thus in men's depraved judgments and affections yet truth which only doth judge itself teacheth that the inquiry of truth which is the love-making, or wooing of it, the knowledge of truth, which is the presence of it, and the belief of truth, which is the enjoying of it, is the sovereign good of human nature. The first creature of God in the works of the days was the light of the sense, the last was the light of reason, and his Sabbath work ever since is the illumination of his spirit. First he breathed light upon the face of the matter or chaos, then he breathed light into the face of man, and still he breathed and inspired that light into the face of his chosen. The poet, that beautiful the sect, that was otherwise inferior to the rest, sate yet excellently well. It is a pleasure to stand upon the shore and to see the ships tossed upon the sea, a pleasure to stand in the window of a castle and to see a battle and the adventures thereof below. But no pleasure is comparable to the standing upon the vantage ground of truth, a hill not to be commanded, and where the air is always clear and serene, and to see the errors and wanderings and mists and tempests in the vale below, so always that his prospects be with pity and not with swelling or pride. Certainly it is heaven upon earth to have a man's mind move in charity, rest in providence and turn upon the poles of truth 
to pass from theological and philosophical truth to a truth of civil business it will be acknowledged even by those that practice it not that clear and round dealing is the honour of man's nature and that mixture of falsehoods is like alloy in coin of gold and silver which may make the metal work the better but it ambassad it for these winding and crooked courses are the goings of a serpent which goeth basely upon the belly and not upon the feet there is no vice that doth so cover a man with shame as to be found false and perfidious and therefore montaigne saith prettily when he inquired the reason why the word of a lie should be such a disgrace and such an odious charge saith he if it be well weighed to say that a man lieth is as much to say as that he is brave towards god and a coward towards men for a lie faces god and shrinks from man surely the wickedness of falsehood and breach of faith cannot possibly be so highly expressed as in that it shall be the last peal to call the judgments of god upon the generations of men it being foretold that when christ cometh he shall not find faith upon the earth end of on truth On the Evolution of Language by J. W. Powell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2018. On the Evolution of Language, as exhibited in the Specialization of the Grammatic Processes, the Differentiation of the Parts of Speech, and the integration of the sentence from a study of indian languages by j w powell possible ideas and thoughts are vast in number a distinct word for every distinct idea and thought would require a vast vocabulary the problem in language is to express many ideas and thoughts with comparatively few words again in the evolution of any language progress is from a condition where few ideas are expressed by a few words to a higher where many ideas are expressed by the use of many words but the number of all possible ideas or thoughts expressed is increased greatly out of proportion with the increase of the number of words and still again in all of those languages which have been most thoroughly studied and by inference in all languages, it appears that the few original words used in any language remain as the elements for the greater number finally used. In the evolution of a language, the introduction of absolutely new material is a comparatively rare phenomenon. The old material is combined and modified in many ways to form the new how has the small stock of words found as the basis of a language been thus combined and modified the way in which the old materials have been used gives rise to what will here be denominated the grammatic processes one the process by combination two or more words may be united to form a new one or to perform the office of a new one and four methods or stages of combination may be noted a by juxtaposition where the two words are placed together and yet remain as distinct words this method is illustrated in chinese where the words in the combination when taken alone seldom give a clue to their meaning when placed together b by compounding where two words are made into one, in which case the original elements of the new word remain in an unmodified condition, as in housetop, rainbow, telltale. C. By agglutination, in which case one or more of the elements entering into combination to form the new word is somewhat changed, the elements are fused together. Yet this modification is not so great as to essentially obscure the primitive words, as in truthful, 
where we easily recognize the original words truth and full and holiday in which holy and day are recognized d by inflection here one or more of the elements entering into the compound has been so changed that it can scarcely be recognized there is a constant tendency to economy in speech by which words are gradually shortened as they are spoken by generation after generation in those words which are combinations of others there are certain elements that wear out more rapidly than others where some particular word is combined with many other different words the tendency to modify by where this oft-used element is great this is more especially the case where the combined word is used in certain categories of combinations as where particular words are used to denote tense in the verb thus did may be used in combination with a verb to denote past time until it is worn down to the sound of d the same wear occurs where particular words are used to form cases in nouns and a variety of illustrations might be given these categories constitute conjugations and declensions and for convenience such combinations may be called paradigmatic then the oft-repeated elements of paradigmatic combinations are apt to become excessively worn and modified so that the primitive words or themes to which they are attached seem to be but slightly changed by the addition under these circumstances combination is called inflection as a morphologic process no well-defined plane of demarcation between these four methods of combination can be drawn as one runs into another but in general words may be said to be juxtaposed when two words being placed together the combination performs the function of a new word while in form the two words remain separate words may be said to be compound when two or more words are combined to form one no change being made in either words may be said to be agglutinated when the elementary words are changed but slightly i e only to the extent that their original forms are not greatly obscured and words may be said to be inflected when in the combination the oft-repeated element or formative part has been so changed that its origin is obscured these inflections are used chiefly in the paradigmatic combinations in the preceding statement it has been assumed that there can be recognized in these combinations of inflection a theme or root as it is sometimes called and a formative element the formative element is used with a great many different words to define or qualify them that is to indicate mode tense number person gender etc of verbs nouns and other parts of speech when in a language juxtaposition is the chief method of combination there may also be distinguished two kinds of elements in some sense corresponding to themes and formative parts the theme is a word the meaning of which is determined by the formative word placed by it that is the theme is a word having many radically different meanings with which meaning it is to be understood is determined only by the formative word which thus serves as its label the ways in which the theme words are thus labeled by the formative word are very curious but the subject cannot be entered into here when words are combined by compounding the formative elements cannot so readily be distinguished from the theme nor for the purposes under immediate consideration can compounding be well separated from agglutination when words are combined by agglutination theme and formative part usually appear the formative parts are affixes and affixes may be divided into three classes prefixes suffixes and infixes these affixes are often called incorporated particles in those indian languages where combination is chiefly by agglutination that is by the use of affixes that is incorporated particles certain parts of the conjunction of the verb especially those which denote gender number and person are effected by the use of article pronouns but in those languages where article pronouns are not found 
the verbs are inflected to accomplish the same part of their conjugation perhaps when we come more fully to study the formative elements in these more highly inflected languages we may discover in such elements greatly modified that is worn out incorporated pronouns two the process by vocalic mutation here in order to form a new word one or more of the vowels of the old word are changed as in man men where an e is substituted for a ran run where u is substituted for a lead led where e with its proper sound is substituted for ea with its proper sound this method is used to a very limited extent in english when the history of the words in which it occurs is studied it is discovered to be but an instance of the wearing out of the different elements of combined words but in the hebrew this method prevails to a very large extent and scholars have not yet been able to discover its origin in combination as they have in english it may or may not have been an original grammatic process but because of its importance in certain languages it has been found necessary to deal with it as a distinct and original process three the process by intonation in english new words are not formed by this method yet words are intoned for certain purposes chiefly rhetorical we use the rising intonation or inflection as it is usually called to indicate that a question is asked and various effects are given to speech by the various intonations of rhetoric but this process is used in other languages to form new words with which to express new ideas in chinese eight distinct intonations are found by the use of which one word may be made to express eight different ideas or perhaps it is better to say that eight words may be made of one. 4. The process by placement. The place or position of a word may affect its significant use. Thus, in English, we say, John struck James. By the position of those words to each other, we know that John is the actor and that James receives the action. By the grammatic processes language is organized organization postulates the differentiation of organs and their combination into integers the integers of language are sentences and their organs are the parts of speech linguistic organization then consists in the differentiation of the parts of speech and the integration of the sentence for example let us take the words john father and love John is the name of an individual, love is the name of a mental action, and father is the name of a person. We put them together. John loves father, and they express a thought. John becomes a noun, and is the subject of the sentence. Love becomes a verb, and is the predicant. Father, a noun, and is the object, and we now have an organized sentence. A sentence requires parts of speech and parts of speech are such because they are used as the organic elements of a sentence the criteria of rank in languages are first grade of organization that is the degree to which the grammatic processes and methods are specialized and the parts of speech differentiated second sematologic content that is the body of thought which the language is competent to convey the grammatic processes may be used for three purposes first for derivation where a new word to express a new idea is made by combining two or more old words or by changing the vowel of one word or by changing the intonation of one word second for modification a word may be qualified or defined by the processes of combination vocalic mutation or intonation it should here be noted that the plane between derivation and qualification is not absolute third for relation when words as signs of ideas are used together to express thought the relation of the words must be expressed by some means in english the relation of words is expressed both by placement and combination that is inflection for agreement 
it should here be noted that paradigmatic inflections are used for two distinct purposes qualification and relation a word is qualified by inflection when the idea expressed by the inflection pertains to the idea expressed by the word inflected thus a noun is qualified by inflection when its number and gender are expressed a word is related by inflection when the office of the word in the sentence is pointed out thereby thus nouns are related by case inflections verbs are related by inflections for gender number and person all inflection for agreement is inflection for relation in english three of the grammatic processes are highly specialized combination is used chiefly for derivation but to some slight extent for qualification and relation in the paradigmatic categories but its use in this manner as compared with many other languages has almost disappeared vocalic mutation is used to a very limited extent and only by accident and can scarcely be said to belong to the english language intonation is used as a grammatic process only to a limited extent simply to exist in forming the interrogative and imperative modes its use here is almost rhetorical in all other cases it is purely rhetorical placement is largely used in the language and is highly specialized performing the office of exhibiting the relations of words to each other in the sentence that is it is used chiefly for syntactic relation thus one of the four processes does not belong to the english language the others are highly specialized the purposes for which the processes are used are derivation modification and syntactic relation derivation is accomplished by combination modification is accomplished by the differentiation of adjectives and adverbs as words phrases and clauses syntactic relation is accomplished by placement syntactic relation must not be confounded with the relation expressed by prepositions syntactic relation is the relation of the parts of speech to each other as integral parts of a sentence prepositions express relations of thought of another order they relate words to each other as words placement relates words to each other as parts of speech in the indian tongues combination is used for all three purposes performing the three different functions of derivation modification and relation placement also is used for relation and for both lines of relation syntactic and prepositional with regard then to the processes and purposes for which they are used we find in the indian languages a low degree of specialization processes are used for diverse purposes and purposes are accomplished by diverse processes differentiation of the parts of speech it is next in order to consider to what degree the parts of speech are differentiated in indian languages as compared with english indian nouns are extremely connotive that is the name does more than simply denote the thing to which it belongs in denoting the object it also assigns to it some quality or characteristic every object has many qualities and characteristics and by describing but a part of these the true office of the noun is but imperfectly performed a strictly denotive name expresses no one quality or character but embraces all qualities in characters in ute the name for bear is he seizes or the hugger in this case the verb is used for the noun and in so doing the indian names the bear by predicating one of its characteristics thus noun and verb are undifferentiated in seneca the north is the sun never goes there and this sentence may be used as adjective or noun in such cases noun adjective verb and adverb are found as one vocable or word and the four parts of speech are undifferentiated in the pavon language a schoolhouse is called po kunt in in yi ken the first part of the word po kunt signifies sorcery is practiced 
and is the name given by the indians to any writing from the fact that when they first learned of writing they supposed it to be a method of practicing sorcery in in yi is the verb signifying to count and the meaning of the word has been extended so as to signify to read can signifies wigwam and is derived from the verb curi to stay thus the name of the schoolhouse literally signifies a staying place where sorcery is counted or where papers are read the pavant in naming a schoolhouse describes the purpose for which it is used these examples illustrate the general characteristics of indian nouns they are excessively connotive a simply denotive name is rarely found in general their name words predicate some attribute of the object named and thus noun adjective and predicant are undifferentiated in many indian languages there is no separate word for eye hand arm or other parts and organs of the body but the word is found with an incorporated or attached pronoun signifying my hand my eye your hand your eye his hand his eye etc as the case may be if the indian in naming these parts refers to his own body he says my if he refers to the body of the person to whom he is speaking he says your etc if an indian should find a detached foot thrown from the amputating table of an army field hospital he would say something like this i have found somebody his foot the linguistic characteristic is widely spread though not universal thus the indian has no command of a fully differentiated noun expressive of eye hand arm or other parts and organs of the body in the pronouns we often have the most difficult part of an indian language pronouns are only to a limited extent independent words among the free pronouns the student must early learn to distinguish between the personal and the demonstrative the demonstrative pronouns are more commonly used the indian is more accustomed to say this person or thing that person or thing than he she or it among the free personal pronouns the student may find an equivalent of the pronoun i another signifying i and you perhaps another signifying i and he and one signifying we more than two including the speaker and those present and another including the speaker and persons absent he will also find personal pronouns in the second and third person perhaps with singular dual and plural forms to a large extent the pronouns are incorporated in the verbs as prefixes infixes or suffixes in such cases we will call them article pronouns these article pronouns point out with great particularity the person number and gender both of subject and object and sometimes of the indirect object when the article pronouns are used the personal pronouns may or may not be used but it is believed that the personal pronouns will always be found article pronouns may not always be found in those languages which are characterized by them they are used alike when the subject and object nouns are expressed and when they are not the student may at first find some difficulty with these article pronouns singular dual and plural forms will be found sometimes distinct incorporated particles will be used for subject and object but often this will not be the case if the subject only is expressed one particle may be used if the object only is expressed another particle but if subject and object are expressed an entirely different particle may stand for both but it is in the genders of these article pronouns that the greatest difficulty may be found the student must entirely free his mind of the idea that gender is simply a distinction of sex in indian tongues genders are usually methods of classification primarily to animate and inanimate the animate may be again divided into male and female but this is rarely the case 
often by these genders all objects are classified by characteristics found in their attitudes or supposed constitution thus we may have the animate and inanimate one or both divided into the standing the sitting and the lying or they may be divided into the watery the mushy the earthy the stony the woody and the fleshy the gender of these article pronouns has rarely been worked out in any language the extent to which these classifications enter into the article pronouns is not well known the subject requires more thorough study these incorporated particles are here called article pronouns in the conjugation of the word they take an important part and have by some writers been called transitions besides pointing out with particularity the person number and gender or the subject and object they perform the same offices that are usually performed by those inflections of the verb that occur to make them agree in gender number and person with the subject in those indian languages where the article pronouns are not found and the personal pronouns only are used the verb is usually inflected to agree with the subject or object or both in the same particulars the article pronouns as they point out person number gender and case of the subject and object are not simple particles but are to a greater or lesser extent compound their component elements may be broken apart and placed in different parts of the verb again the article pronoun in some languages may have its elements combined into a distinct word in such a manner that it will not be incorporated in the verb but will be placed immediately before it for this reason the term article pronoun has been chosen rather than attached pronoun the older term transition was given to them because of their analogy in function to verbal inflections thus the verb of an indian language contains within itself incorporated article pronouns which point out with great particularity the gender number and person of the subject and object in this manner verb pronoun and adjective are combined and to this extent these parts of speech are undifferentiated in some languages the article pronoun constitutes a distinct word but whether free or incorporated it is a complex tissue of adjectives again nouns sometimes contain particles within themselves to predicate possession and to this extent nouns and verbs are undifferentiated the verb is relatively of much greater importance in an indian tongue than in a civilized language to a large extent the pronoun is incorporated in the verb as explained above and thus constitutes a part of its conjugation again adjectives are used as intransitive verbs as in most indian languages there is no verb to be used as a predicant or copula where in english we would say the man is good the indian would say that man good using the adjective as an intransitive verb that is as a predicant if he desired to affirm it in the past tense the intransitive verb good would be inflected or otherwise modified to indicate the tense and so in like manner all adjectives when used to predicate can be modified to indicate mode tense number person etc as other intransitive verbs adverbs are used as intransitive verbs in english we may say he is there the indian would say that person there usually preferring the demonstrative to the personal pronoun the adverb there would therefore be used as a predicant or intransitive verb and might be conjugated to denote different modes tenses numbers persons etc verbs will often receive adverbial qualifications by the use of incorporated particles and still further verbs may contain within themselves adverbial limitations without our being able to trace such meanings to any definite particles or parts of the verb prepositions are intransitive verbs in english we may say the hat is on the table the indian would say that hat on table or he might change the order and say that hat table on 
but the preposition on would be used as an intransitive verb to predicate and may be conjugated prepositions may often be found as particles incorporated in verbs and still further verbs may contain within themselves prepositional meanings without our being able to trace such meanings to any definite particles within the verb but the verb connotes such ideas that something is needed to complete its meaning that something being a limiting or qualifying word phrase or clause prepositions may be prefixed infixed or suffixed to nouns that is they may be particles incorporated in nouns nouns may be used as intransitive verbs under the circumstances when in english we would use a noun as the complement of a sentence after the verb to be the verb therefore often includes within itself subject direct object indirect object qualifier and relation idea thus it is that the study of an indian language is to a large extent the study of its verbs thus adjectives adverbs prepositions and nouns are used as intransitive verbs and to such extent adjectives adverbs prepositions nouns and verbs are undifferentiated from the remarks above it will be seen that indian verbs often include within themselves meanings which in english are expressed by adverbs and adverbial phrases and clauses thus the verb may express within itself direction manner instrument and purpose one or all as the verb to go may be represented by a word signifying go home another go away from home another go to a place other than home another go from a place other than home one go from this place with reference to home one to go up another to go down one go around and perhaps there will be a verb go up hill another go up a valley another go up a river etc then we may have to go on foot to go on horseback to go in a canoe still another to go for water another for wood etc distinct words may be used for all these or a fewer number used and these varied by incorporated particles in like manner the english verb to break may be represented by several words each of which will indicate the manner of performing the act or the instrument with which it is done distinct words may be used or a common word varied with incorporated particles the verb to strike may be represented by several words signifying severally to strike with the fist to strike with a club to strike with the open hand to strike with a whip to strike with a switch to strike with a flat instrument etc a common word may be used with incorporated particles or entirely different words used mode in an indian tongue is a rather difficult subject modes analogous to those of civilized tongues are found and many conditions and qualifications appear in the verb which in english and other civilized languages appear as adverbs and adverbial phrases and clauses no plane of separation can be drawn between such adverbial qualifications and true modes thus there may be a form of the verb which shows that the speaker makes a declaration as certain that is an indicative mode another which shows that the speaker makes a declaration with doubt that is a dubitative mode another that he makes a declaration on hearsay that is a quotative mode another form will be used in making a command giving an imperative mode another in imploration that is an implorative mode another form to denote permission that is a permissive mode another in negation that is a negative mode another form will be used to indicate that the action is simultaneous with some other action that is a simulative mode another to denote desire or wish that something be done that is a desiderative mode another that the action ought to be done that is an obligative mode another that action is repetitive from time to time that is a frequentative mode another that action is caused that is a causative mode etc 
these forms of the verb which we are compelled to call modes are of great number usually with each of them a particular modal particle or incorporated adverb will be used but the particular particle which gives the qualified meaning may not always be discovered and in one language a different word will be introduced wherein another the same word will be used with an incorporated particle it is stated above that incorporated particles may be used to indicate direction manner instrument and purpose in fact any adverbial qualification whatever may be made by an incorporated particle instead of an adverb as a distinct word no line of demarcation can be drawn between these adverbial particles and those mentioned above as modal particles indeed it seems best to treat all these forms of the verb arising from incorporated particles as distinct modes in this sense then an indian language has a multiplicity of modes it should be further remarked that in many cases these modal or adverbial particles are excessively worn so that they may appear as additions or changes of simple vowel or consonant sounds when incorporated particles are thus used distinct adverbial words phrases or clauses may also be employed and the idea expressed twice in an indian language it is usually found difficult to elaborate a system of tenses in paradigmatic form many tenses or time particles are found incorporated in verbs some of these time particles are excessively worn and may appear rather as inflections than as incorporated particles usually rather distinct present past and future tenses are discovered often a remote or ancient past and less often an immediate future but great specification of time in relation to the present and in relation to other time is usually found it was seen above that adverbial particles cannot be separated from modal particles in like manner tense particles cannot be separated from adverbial and modal particles in an indian language adverbs are differentiated only to a limited extent adverbial qualifications are found in the verb and thus there are a multiplicity of modes and tenses and no plane of demarcation can be drawn between mode and tense from preceding statements it will appear that a verb in an indian tongue may have incorporated with it a great variety of particles which can be arranged in three general classes that is pronominal adverbial and prepositional the pronominal particles we have called article pronouns they serve to point out a variety of characteristics in the subject object and indirect object of the verb they thus subserve purposes which in english are subserved by differentiated adjectives as distinct parts of speech they might therefore with some propriety have been called adjective particles but these elements perform another function they serve the purpose which is usually called agreement in language that is they make the verb agree with the subject and object and thus indicate the syntactic relation between subject object and verb in this sense they might with propriety have been called relation particles and doubtless this function was in mind when some of the older grammarians called them transitions the adverbial particles perform the functions of voice mode and tense together with many other functions that are performed in languages spoken by more highly civilized people by differentiated adverbs adverbial phrases and clauses the prepositional particles perform the function of indicating a great variety of subordinate relations like the prepositions used as distinct parts of speech in english by the demonstrative function of some of the pronominal particles they are closely related to adverbial particles and adverbial particles are closely related to prepositional particles so that it will be sometimes difficult to say of a particular particle whether it be pronominal or adverbial and of another particular particle whether it be adverbial or prepositional thus the three classes of particles are not separated by absolute planes of demarcation the use of these particles as parts of the verb the use of nouns adjectives adverbs and prepositions as intransitive verbs and the direct use of verbs as nouns adjectives and adverbs 
make the study of an Indian tongue to a large extent the study of its verbs. To the extent that voice, mode, and tense are accomplished by the use of agglutinated particles or inflections, to that extent adverbs and verbs are undifferentiated. To the extent that adverbs are found as incorporated particles in verbs, the two parts of speech are undifferentiated. To the extent that prepositions are particles incorporated in the verb, prepositions and verbs are undifferentiated. To the extent that prepositions are affixed to nouns, prepositions and nouns are undifferentiated. In all these particulars, it is seen that the Indian tongues belong to a very low type of organization. Various scholars have called attention to this feature by describing Indian languages as being holophrastic, polysynthetic, or synthetic. The term synthetic is perhaps the best, and may be used as synonymous with undifferentiated. Indian tongues, therefore, may be said to be highly synthetic in that their parts of speech are imperfectly differentiated. In these same particulars, the English language is highly organized, as the parts of speech are highly differentiated. Yet the difference is one of degree, not of kind. To the extent in the English language that inflection is used for qualification, as for person, number, and gender of the noun and pronoun, and for mode and tense in the verb, to that extent the parts of speech are undifferentiated. But we have seen that inflection is used for this purpose to a very slight extent. There is yet in the English language one important differentiation which has been but partially accomplished. Verbs as usually considered are undifferentiated parts of speech. They are nouns and adjectives, one or both, and predicants. The predicant simple is a distinct part of speech. The English language has but one, the verb to be, and this is not always a pure predicant, for it sometimes contains within itself an adverbial element when it is conjugated for mode and tense, and a connective element when it is conjugated for agreement. With adjectives and nouns, this verb is used as a predicant. In the passive voice also it is thus used, and the participles are nouns or adjectives. In what is sometimes called the progressive form of the active voice, nouns and adjectives are differentiated in the participles, and the verb to be is used as a predicant. But in what is usually denominated the active voice of the verb, the English language has undifferentiated parts of speech. An examination of the history of the verb to be in the English language exhibits the fact that it is coming more and more to be used as the predicant, and what is usually called the common form of the active voice is coming more and more to be limited in its use to special significations. The real active voice, indicative mode, present tense, first person, singular number of the verb to eat is am eating. The expression I eat signifies I am accustomed to eat. So, if we consider the common form of the active voice throughout its entire conjugation, we discover that many of its forms are limited to special uses. Throughout the conjugation of the verb, the auxiliaries are predicants, but these auxiliaries, to the extent that they are modified for mode, tense, number and person, contain adverbial and connective elements. In like manner, many of the lexical elements of the English language contain more than one part of speech. To ascend is to go up, to descend is to go down, and to depart is to go from. Thus it is seen that the English language is also synthetic, in that its parts of speech are not completely differentiated. The English, then, differs in this respect from an Indian language only in degree. In most Indian tongues no pure predicant has been differentiated, but in some the verb to be, or predicant, has been slightly developed, chiefly to affirm existence in a place. It will thus be seen that by the criterion of organization, Indian tongues are of very low grade. It need but to be affirmed that by the criterion of sematologic content, Indian languages are of a very low grade. 
Therefore, the frequently expressed opinion that the languages of barbaric peoples have a more highly organized grammatic structure than the languages of civilized peoples has its complete refutation. It is worthy of remark that all paradigmatic inflection in a civilized tongue is a relic of its barbaric condition. When the parts of speech are fully differentiated and the process of placement fully specialized, so that the order of words in sentences has its full significance, no useful purpose is subserved by inflection. Economy in speech is the force by which its development has been accomplished, and it divides itself properly into economy of utterance and economy of thought. Economy of utterance has had to do with the phonetic constitution of words, economy of thought has developed the sentence. All paradigmatic inflection requires unnecessary thought. In the clause, if he was here, if fully expresses the subjunctive condition, and it is quite unnecessary to express it a second time by using another form of the verb to be. And so the people who are using the English language are deciding, for the subjunctive form is rapidly becoming obsolete with the long list of paradigmatic forms which have disappeared. Every time the pronoun he, she, or it is used, it is necessary to think of the sex of its antecedent, though in its use there is no reason why sex should be expressed, say, one time in ten thousand. If one pronoun non-expressive of gender were used instead of the three, with three gender adjectives, then in 9,999 cases the speaker would be relieved of the necessity of an unnecessary thought, and in the one case an adjective would fully express it. But when these inflections are greatly multiplied, as they are in the Indian languages, like with the Greek and Latin, the speaker is compelled in the choice of a word to express his idea to think of a multiplicity of things which have no connection with that which he wishes to express. A Ponca Indian, in saying that a man killed a rabbit, would have to say, the man, he, one, animate, standing, in the nominative case, purposely killed, by shooting an arrow, the rabbit, he, the one, animate, sitting, in the objective case. For the form of a verb, to kill would have to be selected, and the verb changes its form by inflection and incorporated particles to denote person, number, and gender as animate or inanimate, and gender as standing, sitting, or lying, and case. And the form of the verb would also express whether the killing was done accidentally or purposely, and whether it was by shooting or by some other process, and, if by shooting, whether by bow and arrow, or with a gun, and the form of the verb would in like manner have to express all of these things relating to the object, that is, the person, number, gender, and case of the object, and from the multiplicity of paradigmatic forms of the verb to kill, this particular one would have to be selected. Perhaps one time in a million it would be the purpose to express all of these particulars, and in that case the Indian would have the whole expression in one compact word, but in the 999,999 cases all of these particulars would have to be thought of in the selection of the form of the verb when no valuable purpose would be accomplished thereby. In the development of the English, as well as the French and German, linguistic evolution has not been in vain. Judged by these criteria, the English stands alone in the highest rank, but as a written language, in the way in which its alphabet is used, the English has but emerged from a barbaric condition. End of On the Evolution of Language by J. W. Powell On Suicide Arthur Schopenhauer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As far as I know, none but the votaries of monotheistic, that is to say, Jewish religion, 
look upon suicide as a crime that is all the more striking in as such as neither in the old nor in the new testament is there to be found any prohibitions or positive disapproval of it so that religious teachers are forced to base their condemnation of suicide on philosophical grounds of their own invention these are so very bad that writers of this kind endeavor to make up for the weakness of their argument by the strong terms in which they express their abhorrence of a practice in other words they declaim against it they tell us that suicide is the greatest piece of cowardice that only a madman could be guilty of it and other insipidities of the same kind or else they make the nonsensical remark that suicide is wrong when it is quite obvious that there is nothing in the world to which every male has a more unsaleable title than to his own life and person suicide as i have said is actually accounted a crime and a crime which especially under the vulgar bigotry that prevails in england is followed by an ignominious burial and the seizure of a man's property and for that reason in a case of suicide the jury almost always brings in a verdict of insanity now let the reader's own world feelings decide whether or not suicide or not is a criminal act think of the impression that would be made upon you by the news that someone you know had committed the crime say of murder or theft or been guilty of some act of cruelty or of deception and compare it with your feelings when you hear that he has met a voluntary death well in the one case a lively sense of indignation and extreme resentment will be aroused and you will loudly call for punishment or revenge in the other you will be moved to grief sympathy and mingled with your thoughts will be admiration for his courage rather than the moral disapproval which follows upon a wicked action who has not had acquaintances friends relations who of their own free will have left this world and are these to be thought of with horror as criminals most emphatically no i am rather of the opinion that the clergy should be challenged to explain what right they have to go into the pulpit or take up their pens and hold as a crime an action which many men whom we hold in affection and honour have committed and to refuse an honourable burial to those who relinquish this world voluntarily they have no biblical authority to boast of as justifying their condemnation of suicide nay nor even any philosophical arguments that will halt water and it must be understood that it is arguments we want and that we will not be put off with mere phrases or words of abuse if the criminal law forbids suicide that is not an argument valid in the church and besides the prohibition is ridiculous for what penalty can frighten a man who is not afraid of death itself if the law punishes people for trying to commit suicide it is punishing the want of skill that makes the attempt a failure the ancients moreover were very far from regarding the matter in that light pliny says life is not so desirable a thing as to be protracted at any cost whoever you are you are sure to die even though your life has been full of abomination and crime the chief of all remedies for a troubled mind is the feeling that among the blessing which nature gives to man there is none greater than the opportune death and the best of it is that every one can avail himself of it and elsewhere the same writer declares not even to god are all things possible for he could not compass his own death if he willed to die and yet in the misery of our earthly life this is the best of his gifts to man nay in massilia and the isle of chios the man who would give valid reasons for relinquishing his life was handed the cup of hamlock by the magistrate and that too in public and in ancient times how many heroes and wise men died a voluntary death aristotle it is true declared suicide to be an offence against the state although not against a person but in stabius exposition of the peripatetic 
philosophy bears the following remark the good man should flee life when his misfortunes become too great the bad man also when he is too prosperous and similarly so he will marry and beget children and take part in the affairs of the state and generally practice virtue and continue to live and then again if need be and at any time necessity compels him he will depart to his place of refuge in the tomb and we find that the stoics actually praised suicide as a noble and heroic action as hundreds of passages show above all in the works of seneca who expresses the strongest approval of it as is well known the hindus look upon suicide as a religious act especially when it takes the form of self-immolation by widows but also when it consists in casting oneself under the wheels of a chariot of the god at juggernaut or being eaten by crocodiles in the ganes or being drowned in the holy tanks in the temples and so on the same thing occurs on the stage the mirror of life for example in l'orphelin de la chine a celebrated chinese play almost all the noble characters end by suicide without the slightest hint anywhere or any impression being produced on the spectator that they are committing a crime and in her own theatre it is much the same for instance in mahomet or mortimer and maria stuart othello countess tarksky is hamlet's monologue the meditation of a criminal he merely declares that if we had any certainty of being annihilated by it death would be infinitely preferable to the world as it is but there lies the rub the reasons advanced against suicide by the clergy of monotheistic that is to say jewish religions and by those philosophers who adept themselves thereto are weak sophisms which can be easily refuted the most thorough going refutation of them is given by hume in his essay on suicide this did not appear until after his death when it was immediately suppressed owing to the scandalous bigotry and outrageous ecclesiastical tyranny that prevailed in england and hence only a very few copies of it were sold under cover of secrecy and at a high price this and the other treatise by that great man have come to us from basil and we may be thankful for the reprint it is a great disgrace to the english nation that a purely philosophical treatise which proceeding from one of the first thinkers and writers in england aimed at refuting the current arguments against suicide by the light of cold reason should be forced to sneak about in that country as though it were some rascally production until at last it found refuge in the continent at the same time it shows what good conscience the church has in such matters in my chief work i have explained the only valid reason existing against suicide on the score of mortality it is this that suicide thwarts the attainment of the highest moral aim by the fact that for a real release from this world of misery it substitutes one that is merely apparent but from a mistake to a crime is a far cry and it is as a crime that the clergy of christendom wish us to regard suicide the inmost kernel of christianity is the truth that suffering the cross is the real end and object of life hence christianity condemns suicide as thwarting this end whilst the ancient world taking a lower point of view held it in approval nay in honour but if that is to be accounted a valid reason against suicide it involves the recognition of aestheticism that is to say it is valid only from a much higher ethical standpoint than has ever been adapted by moral philosophers in europe if we abandon that high standpoint there is no tenable reason left on the score of morality for condemning suicide the extraordinary energy and zeal with which the clergy of monotheistic religions attack suicide is not supported either by any passages in the bible or by any considerations of weight so that it looks as though they must have some secret reason for their contention may it not be this that the voluntary surrender of life is a bad compliment for him who said that all things were good this is so 
it offers another instance of the crass optimism of these religions, denouncing suicide to escape being denounced by. It will generally be found that, as soon as the terrors of life reach the point at which they outweigh the terrors of death, a man will put an end to his life. But the terrors of death offer considerable resistance. They stand like a sentinel at the gate leading out of this world. Perhaps there is no man alive who would not have already put an end to his life if this end had been of a purely negative character, a sudden stoppage of existence. There is something positive about it. It is the destruction of a body, and a man shrinks from that, because his body is the manifestation of the will to live. However, the struggle with that sentinel is, as a rule, not so hard as it may seem from a long way off, mainly in the consequence of the antagonisms between the ills of the body and the ills of the mind. If we are in great bodily pain, or the pain lasts a long time, we will become indifferent to other troubles. All we think about is to get well. In the same way, great mental suffering makes us insensible to bodily pain. We despise it. Nay, if it should outweigh the other, it distracts our thoughts. And we welcome it as a pause in mental suffering. It is this feeling that makes suicide easy. For the bodily pain that accompanies it loses all significance in the eye of one who is tortured by an excess of mental suffering. This is especially evident in the case of those who are driven to suicide by some purely morbid and exaggerated ill humor. No special effort to overcome their feelings is necessary, nor do such people require to be worked up in order to take the step. But as soon as the keeper into whose charge they are given leaves them for a couple of minutes, they quickly bring their life to an end. When in some dreadful and ghastly dream, we reach the moment of greatest horror, it awakes us, therefore banishing all the hideous shapes that were born in the night. And life is a dream. When a moment of greatest horror compels us to break it off, the same thing happens. Suicide may also be regarded as an experiment, a question which man puts to nature, trying to force her to an answer. The question is this. What change will death produce in a man's existence, in his insight into the nature of things? It is a clumsy experiment to make, for it involves the destruction of the very consciousness which puts the question and awaits the answer. End of On Suicide Arthur Schopenhauer Preparation for a Christian Life, Section 3, by Soren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, published in 1850. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Come hither unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come hither, for he supposes that they that labor, and are heavy laden, feel their burden, and their labor, and that they stand there now, perplexed, and sighing, one casting about with his eyes to discover whether there is help in sight anywhere another with his eyes fixed on the ground because he can see no consolation and a third with his eyes staring heavenward as though help was bound to come from heaven but all seeking therefore he saith come hither but he invites not him who has ceased to seek and to sorrow come hither for he who invites knows that it is a mark of true suffering if one walks alone and broods in silent disconsolateness without courage to confide in any one and with even less confidence to dare to hope for help alas not only he whom we read about was possessed of a dumb devil no suffering which does not first of all render the sufferer dumb is of much significance no more than the love which does not render one silent 
for those sufferers who run on about their afflictions neither labor nor are heavy laden behold therefore the inviter will not wait till they that labor and are heavy laden come to him but calls them lovingly for all his willingness to help might perhaps be of no avail if he did not say these words and thereby take the first step for in the call of these words come hither unto me he comes himself to them ah human compassion sometimes perhaps it is indeed praiseworthy self-restraint sometimes perhaps even true compassion which may cause you to refrain from questioning him whom you suppose to be brooding over a hidden affliction but also how often indeed is this compassion but worldly wisdom which does not care to know too much ah human compassion how often was it not pure curiosity and not compassion which prompted you to venture into the secret of one afflicted and how burdensome it was almost like a punishment of your curiosity when he accepted your invitation and came to you but he who saith these redeeming words come hither he is not deceiving himself in saying these words nor will he deceive you when you come to him in order to find rest by throwing your burden on him he follows the promptings of his heart in saying these words and his heart follows his words if you then follow these words they will follow you back again to his heart this follows as a matter of course ah will you not follow the invitation come hither for he supposes that they that labor and are heavy laden are so worn out and overtaxed and so near swooning that they have forgotten as though in a stupor that there is such a thing as consolation alas or he knows for sure that there is no consolation and no help unless it is sought from him and therefore must he call out to them come hither come hither for is it not so that every society has some symbol or token which is worn by those who belong to it when a young girl is adorned in a certain manner one knows that she is going to the dance come hither all ye that labor and are heavy laden come hither you need not carry an external and visible badge come but with your head anointed and your face washed if only you labor in your heart and are heavy laden come hither ah do not stand still and consider nay consider consider that with every moment you stand still after having heard the invitation you will hear the call more faintly and thus withdraw from it even though you are standing still come hither ah however weary and faint you be from work or from the long long and yet hitherto fruitless search for help and salvation and even though you may feel as if you could not take one more step and not wait one more moment without dropping to the ground ah but this one step and here is rest come hither but if alas there be one who is so wretched that he cannot come ah a sigh is sufficient your mere sign for him is also to come hither end of preparation for a christian life three by soren kierkegaard published in eighteen fifty the sailings of southern illinois by george w smith from the Transactions of the Illinois State Historical Society, 1904. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The evidence that salt was made within the limits of the present state of Illinois by other people than Indians and Europeans would not be regarded as very trustworthy before a court of the common people but to the man who is accustomed to look into the things about him in a scientific way 
there is abundant evidence that salt was manufactured in southern illinois by a people whose history antedates that of the tribes who inhabited this country at the coming of the europeans the evidence of prehistoric salt making in the southern part of this state rests very largely upon the fact that in the region of salt springs and salt licks a species of pottery is found whose use can be explained on no other theory so well as on the one which assumes that the vessels were employed in the manufacture of salt on the saline river which flows towards the east and southeast through the counties of williamson saline and gallatin there are two very noted localities they are about four miles apart one locality is noted for a very strong salt spring a strong sulphur spring and a freshwater spring this locality has several names but it is usually called the nigger spring the nigger well and the nigger furnace it is four miles down the river from the present town of equality the other locality is marked by what in early times was called the half moon lick and also by very strong deep wells this point is about one mile from the town of equality and very near the saline river the earliest known english people to settle in this locality came about eighteen hundred or possibly in eighteen o two in the region of the nigger spring and in that of the half moon lick the earliest english settlers found large quantities of all sorts of pottery tomahawks arrowheads vases and other similar articles in addition to these familiar articles there was found a species of pottery unlike that found in other localities these pieces of pottery seemed to be parts of large vessels a sketch of illinois published in philadelphia in eighteen thirty seven contains a short account of gallatin county the nigger spring is called the great salt spring this sketch says the principal spring was formerly possessed by the indians who valued it very highly and it appears probable that they had long been acquainted with the method of making salt large fragments of earthenware are continually found near the works both on and under the surface of the earth they have on them the impression of basket or wicker work mr george e sellers a very noted man of gallatin county in an article in the september issue of the popular science monthly for eighteen seventy seven attempts to disprove the current belief that the markings on this pottery were made by a basket or framework in which the vessel is supposed to have been molded his theory is that the impressions were made by wrapping coarse cloth around the vessels as they were lifted off the mold which was within the vessel mr sellers quotes from a number of scientific writers who seem to have either visited the region around the great salt spring or else had specimens of pottery from that locality all the gentlemen who have examined this peculiar pottery are of the opinion that the vessels were used in the manufacture of salt mr sellers first visited the place as early as eighteen fifty four and he says at that time that all about the salt springs there was an abundance of this pottery just above the springs on a ridge which was in cultivation as early as eighteen fifty four mr sellers found acres actually covered with the old salt pans he thinks the people whoever they were were accustomed to take the water upon the hill and there in the pans let the water evaporate possibly the process was hastened by dropping into the pans large stones previously heated in a fire again all around the half moon lick which is near the town of equality 
large quantities of the same kind of pottery has been found in the report of the illinois board world's fair commissioners eighteen ninety three page two eighty three professor william mcadams says these salt pans have been found in abundance both in and around the salt works in illinois and in missouri near st genevieve he describes them all as having those peculiar markings to which i have referred mr mcadams found two of these pans entire near the salt works at st genevieve missouri they were serving as a coffin it seemed the corpse was put into one of these pans and another pan inverted over the first one and then some earth thrown over the casket professor mcadams says these salt pans are from three to five feet in diameter there are traditions that the salt springs wells and licks on the saline river in gallatin county were operated by the indians and french for many years previous to the coming of the english about eighteen hundred certain it is that the french understood the salt making process the indians without doubt knew where the springs and licks were an english gentleman writing to the earl of hillsborough in 1770 in speaking of the region around the mouth of the wabash and the saline rivers mentioned the abundance of salt springs in that region captain thomas hutchins in a book called topographical description of virginia in describing the region of the wabash says the wabash abounds with salt springs and any quantity of salt may be made from them in a manner now done in the illinois country this was in 1778 22 years before the coming of any english people mr charles carroll of shawnee town told me it had always been his understanding that the french operated the wells and springs several years previous to eighteen hundred a history of illinois said to have been written by calvin leonard and published by ivison blakeman taylor and company about eighteen seventy has an account of salt making by the french and of a massacre of them by the shawnee indians the chicago historical society knows nothing of such a book and i have doubts of its existence count volney who made a tour of north america from seventeen ninety five to seventeen ninety eight spent considerable time in vincennes in seventeen ninety eight and speaks of the brine springs at st genevieve missouri but says not a word about the springs on the saline river mr william mcavoy now of equality says that general leonard white knew volney very well and says that general white told him mcavoy that volney stayed a month in the neighborhood of the salt works i pressed mr mcavoy very closely and he still insisted that general leonard white had often told him of volney's visit to the locality but i could not find a single word about the salt works on the saline in volney's writings so i am inclined to think there is some error in mr mcavoy's tradition the earliest reference i was able to find in the american state papers is in the law of may eighteenth seventeen ninety six in an act of this date it is made the duty of the surveyors working for the united states and making surveys in the territory northwest of the ohio river to observe closely for mines salt springs and salt licks and mill seats evidently there were no wells or springs operated in ohio this early for in the life of ephraim cutler son of rev manassa cutler he says that in seventeen ninety six when he came to the settlements below marietta that there was no salt to be had west of the mountains except at marietta and what was for sale here had been brought over the mountains on pack horses he says further that this salt was sold for sixteen cents per pound 
Mr. Cutler further says that in 1798 the Shawnee Indians told Lieutenant George Irving that 50 miles inland from the Ohio River there was a salt spring. Search was made and the spring found near what is now the town of Chandlersville, 10 miles southeast of Zanesville. A salt company was organized by four settlements and men sent to make salt. Four men could make six bushels a week by hard work. In the winter of 1799 and 1800, William Henry Harrison was the delegate in Congress from the territory of the Northwest. In his report, Mr. Harrison says, Upon inquiry, we find that salt springs and salt licks on the east of the Muskegon and near the Great Miami are operated by individuals, and timber is being wasted. Therefore, we recommend that salt springs and salt licks, property of the United States in the territory northwest of the Ohio, ought to be leased for a term of years. The report was referred to the Committee of the Whole, but no definite action was taken on the Committee's recommendation. Harrison became Governor of the Indiana Territory in the summer of 1800. In 1802, he visited Kaskaskia and was there importuned to call a convention to take steps looking toward the introduction of slavery into the Northwest Territory. The convention was called in the fall of 1802. Among other things, the convention asked Congress to annul the sixth article of the Ordinance of 1787 and to grant saline below the mouth of the Wabash to the Territory. Congress received the memorial and granted neither of the two requests. On March 3, 1803, Congress authorized the Secretary of the Treasury to lease the salt springs and licks for the benefit of the government. On June seventh of the same year, Harrison negotiated a treaty at Fort Wayne between the government and five Indian tribes. This treaty ceded to the United States two million thirty eight thousand four hundred acres of lands in what is now southern indiana and illinois in the same summer of eighteen o three governor harrison leased the saline on the saline river to a captain bell of lexington kentucky i am inclined to think that probably this captain bell was at that time working the salt springs on saline river by permission of the indians reynolds says the first white man to settle in shawnee town was a michael sprinkle who came about eighteen o two and about the same time a frenchman la bossiere settled there and ran a ferry to accommodate people who were coming out of kentucky to the salt works on the saline river captain bell no doubt worked the salt springs till the end of eighteen o six for the records show that for the year eighteen o seven the works were leased to john bates of jefferson county kentucky by act of congress march twenty sixth eighteen o four there were established three land offices one at kaskaskia one at detroit and one at vincennes and by the same act all salt springs wells and licks with the necessary land adjacent thereto were reserved from sale as the property of the united states the territorial governor was authorized to lease these salt wells and springs to the best advantage of the government on the thirtieth of april eighteen o five governor harrison appointed his friend isaac white then of vincennes to be government agent to reside at the salt works and to receive the rental due the united states mr white assumed the duties of his position and was assisted by john marshall who probably lived in shawnee town just where white resided is not known 
but presumably at what i have designated as the nigger well some four miles below equality in eighteen o six september eighth governor harrison appointed mr white a captain in the knox county militia from evidence of a private nature white himself became leasee of the salt works in eighteen o eight and perhaps retained control of them till eighteen ten or eighteen eleven while captain white was residing at the salt works he became involved in a difficulty with a captain butler and butler challenged white to mortal combat the challenge was accepted and two days before the day set for the duel captain white wrote his wife who perhaps was at vincennes a very touching letter telling her he expected to be killed on the same day that he wrote his wife he made his will signed and sealed it on the day set for the duel butler and white both appeared on the appointed spot and they were informed by their seconds that horse pistols were the weapons distance six feet butler backed down and refused to fight saying that it would be murder and he could not engage in such an affair in eighteen eleven captain white now a colonel in the illinois militia sold out his interest in the salt works to three men jonathan taylor of randolph county illinois charles wilkins and james morrison of lexington kentucky from the beginning of eighteen o eight to eighteen eleven leonard white afterwards known as general leonard white seems to have been the government agent he himself later on became interested in salt making in the summer of eighteen eleven colonel isaac white was in vincennes and was initiated into the masonic lodge at that place and on september nineteenth eighteen eleven he was raised to the sublime degree of master mason colonel joe davies of kentucky who was in vincennes at the same time acted as worshipful master colonel davies was in vincennes in response to an invitation from governor harrison preparatory to an attack upon the indians on november seventh eighteen eleven colonel davies and colonel white fell side by side in the battle of tippecanoe on february twelfth eighteen twelve congress created the shawnee town land district thomas slough was appointed register and john caldwell was made receiver in this same act a provision authorized the president to reserve not less than one township of the land around the salt works from sale leonard white willis hargrave and philip trammell were made a commission to select the lands which should be reserved as the saline reservation they performed their duty and set aside ninety six thousand seven hundred sixty six point seven nine acres this was something over four townships this was and is yet called the reservation about the same time mr slew notified the general land office that there were saline indications in other localities in southern illinois and he was accordingly authorized to make reservations adjacent to such springs or licks mr slew made a tour of inspection and as a result about eighty four thousand acres additional were reserved for saline purposes from eighteen o seven to the admission of illinois august twenty sixth eighteen eighteen the entire rental accruing to the united states from the salines on the saline river was a hundred and fifty eight thousand three hundred and ninety four bushels and the total cash turned into the treasury for the same time was twenty eight thousand one hundred sixty point twenty five dollars ohio turned in two hundred and forty dollars in the same time while indiana kentucky and missouri made no returns in eighteen eighteen april eighteenth an enabling act was passed 
by which illinois was permitted to make a constitution and apply for admission into the union the act contains seven sections the sixth section has four parts part two reads as follows all salt springs within such state and the land reserved for the use of the same shall be granted to the said state for the use of said state and the same to be used under such terms and conditions and regulations as the legislature of the said state shall direct provided the legislature shall never sell nor lease the same for a longer period than ten years at any one time in pursuance of this act the constitutional convention met at kaskaskia in the summer of eighteen eighteen and made a constitution in that constitution are some provisions that used to be a great mystery to me act six deals with the question of slavery section two of the sixth article reads as follows no person bound to labor in any state shall be hired to labor in this state except within the tract reserved for the salt works near shawnee town nor even at that place for a longer period than one year at any one time nor shall it be allowed there after the year eighteen twenty five any violation of this article shall affect the emancipation of such person from his obligation of service the second section of the sixth article provides that all indentures entered into without fraud or collusion prior to the making of the constitution according to the laws of illinois territory shall be held as valid and the person so indented must be held to a fulfillment of the agreement in the contract section one provides that no person could be held to service under an indenture hereafter to be made unless the person was in a state of freedom at the time of making his contract and indentures made by negroes and mulattoes are not valid for a longer time than one year this sixth article deals almost wholly with conditions at the salt works on the saline river at the time the constitution was made congress as well as the territorial legislature of the northwest territory was memorialized time and again for some relief from the sixth article of the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven as soon as indiana territory passed into the second grade of political organization the legislature passed a law permitting the bringing into the territory of negroes and mulattoes who were slaves in other states the law which regulated the bringing in of the slaves while illinois was a territory was passed by the legislature of indiana in eighteen o five it provided one that slaves over fifteen years of age might be brought in from slave states and within thirty days the owner might enter into an agreement with the said slave by which the slave agreed to work in illinois for a stated time for a consideration two if within the thirty days the slave refused to enter into such an agreement his master had thirty days in which to return him to a slave state this law was applicable in any part of the indiana territory but it was especially advantageous to the leasees of the salt works on saline river mr sellers says in the article in the popular science monthly that the nigger well or salt works was worked almost wholly by negro slaves the rev samuel westbrook now ninety-five years of age told me he came to johnson county in eighteen twelve and from there finally to equality in eighteen twenty six at that time the wells about the half moon lick were vigorously operated i was very particular to ask him about the use of slave labor and he seemed to think there were a great many negroes and mulattoes at work 
in the various forms of industry but he seemed to think that most of the colored people were free at that time in my search for information relative to the use of slave labor in the salt works i was directed to a colored family seven miles northwest from equality i found the man of the house mr george elliott about fifty years old while an unmarried sister was sixty two years old i found these colored people very intelligent and quite prosperous farmers when i made my mission known mr elliott said his sister would provide me with all their old papers his sister brought out a large roll of papers that belonged to their father from these two colored people and the papers i secured the following facts their father cornelius elliott was born a slave in seventeen ninety one his master was john elliott of maury county tennessee cornelius had evidently been a laborer in the salt works on the saline river from the time he was old and large enough to be of service in eighteen nineteen timothy gard one of the leases of the salt works seems to have gone into tennessee and bought this slave cornelius of john elliott he brought the negro to the half moon lick and set him to work cornelius was a cooper and barrels were in great demand in eighteen twenty one timothy gard had it in his heart to set cornelius free it appears that cornelius had earned one thousand dollars in the three years either mr gard had received directly the profit of the negro's labor and counted it worth one thousand dollars or else the slave had been permitted to lay by his earnings at any rate i read an indenture on parchment which was written in timothy gard's handwriting in which he says that in consideration of one thousand dollars cash in hand he gives cornelius his freedom the document is signed by timothy gard and sworn to before john marshall a justice of the peace following which is a certificate by joseph m street who was clerk of the court to the effect that john marshall was a justice of the peace within a few years after cornelius had purchased his own freedom he bought the freedom of his mother and three brothers for one of his brothers he paid the sum of five hundred and fifty dollars and i read the manumission papers in eighteen twenty eight cornelius married a free negress from kentucky he then bought eighty acres of land and commenced farming he afterwards bought more land and at the time of his death he owned three hundred and sixty acres of good farming land six or seven miles northwest of equality this story of cornelius elliott is probably only one of scores of similar stories which may be truthfully told of the period of industrial service in the salt works in gallatin county in eighteen eighteen when illinois became a state the salt springs wells and licks with the lands adjacent became the property of the state of illinois at this time there were in existence five distinct leases of salt wells and springs from the united states to individuals the leases had been made by ninian edwards representing the government and all bore date of eighteen seventeen one was with willis hargrave and meredith fisher a second was with jonathan taylor a third with george robinson a fourth was with james ratcliffe a fifth with timothy gard the benefit of the unexpired leases from august twenty sixth eighteen eighteen to june nineteen eighteen twenty fell to the state of illinois the legislature which met at kaskaskia in the winter of eighteen 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 nineteen authorized the governor of the state to continue these leases with the above named gentlemen the governor was also authorized to lease the big muddy saline for a term of ten years 
this saline was in jackson county three miles west of the present city of murfreesboro this saline had been leased to conrad will march twenty fifth eighteen fifteen for three years brownsville was made the county seat of jackson county in eighteen sixteen the salt wells were near the town one a half mile above and one a mile below or down the river from the town mr will came to kaskaskia from pennsylvania about eighteen eleven he bought a drove of cattle and took them back to pennsylvania he must have returned shortly after this for he seems to have been in kaskaskia some time previous to his leasing the wells in eighteen fifteen it is more than probable that either mr will or someone else was working the wells on big muddy prior to eighteen fifteen at least mr will returned to pennsylvania the second time it seems after kettles to make salt these kettles mr will probably brought down the ohio up the mississippi and then up the big muddy on keel boats he brought his family to brownsville about eighteen fourteen or eighteen fifteen they lived at first in a double log house which is said to have stood for many years help was scarce in jackson county in eighteen fifteen so mr will is said to have gone into kentucky and brought slaves to his salt works conrad will was a doctor and his granddaughter now living in carbondale has some of his books he made salt and ran a tan yard he served in the constitutional convention of eighteen eighteen and in several of the early legislatures he had one granddaughter who was born in eighteen twenty eight several years before mr will's death in eighteen twenty four the legislature authorized the governor to lease the big muddy saline to james pierce in eighteen twenty seven mr pierce not having accomplished much in his salt making the legislature relieved him of his obligation relative to the salt works in eighteen thirty four the wells were leased to conrad will again till eighteen forty at this time eighteen forty the lands should be sold there is no record of any income to the general government or to the state from the big muddy saline at this place as i have noted there were two wells about a mile apart the machinery consisted of a row or double row of kettles set over an open ditch the sides of this ditch were lined with cut sandstone at one end of the row of kettles the fires were kept going and at the other end of the row was a smokestack the kettles were very large holding about one hundred gallons each to within the past ten years the old furnaces were quite undisturbed but of late the rocks have all been taken out to make foundations the old kettles are scattered over the neighborhood and are used chiefly for scalding the hogs at butchering time one of the wells had a copper pipe running down into the earth through which the water flowed out at the top a few years ago an enterprising citizen hitched his team to the pipe and twisted it off several feet below the surface water still flows out at that point there was in the first part of the last century a saline in monroe county nine miles due west of the present city of waterloo it was owned and worked by general edgar the hon a c bollinger of waterloo took the pains to secure some facts about this saline but he was unable to secure any information of value Colonel William R. Morrison was unable to furnish anything definite, but suggested that Dr. Lewis James of Old Mines, Missouri, might be able to give some valuable facts concerning this saline. But a letter to the doctor failed to bring a response. In 1826, the United States Senate asked the Secretary of the Treasury for a complete report of all incomes from the salines and also a description of all reservations in this report from the secretary of the treasury no mention is made of salines in monroe madison or bond counties however from reliable sources 
we know that Judge Biggs made salt in Madison on Silver Creek and in Bond on Shoal Creek, and from an act of the legislature in 1827, it appears that Stephen Galliard and Samuel Montgomery were leasees of a saline on Shoal Creek in Bond County. By act of the legislature, January 23, 1833, the governor was authorized to lease the salines in Bond County or to appoint an agent to take charge of them. The wells were on section 32 in Township 6, Range 4. One section was reserved from sale. The first well was just at the edge of the water of Shoal Creek. The settlers dug a second well on higher ground and drew the water with ordinary water buckets. The boiling was done in kettles, and it is said there were as many as 90 of them. Many of the kettles are to be found in the locality. Besides Montgomery and Galliard above referred to, James Coyle, Spencer, John Lee, and other made salt here. James Coyle settled near the wells in 1817, and on April 4, 1822, a son, Jeremiah Coyle, was born, and he still lives on the old homestead. I am indebted to the Reverend Thomas W. Hines for the facts about the Shoal Creek saline. In the early days of salt making on the Saline River, wood only was used for fuel. The water was boiled in large cast iron kettles holding from 60 to 100 gallons. They were placed in rows, and one furnace would sometimes have from 20 to 30 kettles. At first, the furnace was close to the well or spring. Timber was plentiful, and it was not difficult to keep the furnace supplied with fuel. As time went on, the process became more systematic, and the works grew. More timber was needed to make more salt. The item of hauling wood three or four miles became a serious one. In those days, there were professional axemen, expert teamsters, and skilled firemen. It was a busy scene. Twenty or thirty axemen in the timber, eight or ten, four or six mule teams on the roads from the timber to the furnaces, six or eight regular firemen, kettle hands, coopers, salt packers, salesmen, timekeepers, boarding house keepers, freighters, hoop pole merchants, and hangers on by the score. The water was put in fresh at the fire end of the row and moved from kettle to kettle back toward the chimney where there was a large flat stirring off pan. Attached to this pan was a large draining board. The salt was scraped up to one side of the pan and shoveled up on this board. The water drained back into the pan and the salt became dry. It was then taken to the salt shed where it was packed in barrels and was then ready for the market. When the timber had been used up back three or four miles, then they moved the works to the fuel. The water must now be gotten to the furnaces. This to modern engineers would be a simple problem, but to our friends of 100 years ago, it was not so simple a task. The plan required a long, tedious preparation. Large, straight trees from 16 to 20 feet long in body were cut. They must be at least 10 inches in diameter at the small end. This would make them 14 to 16 inches in diameter at the large end. With a four-inch auger, a hole was bored lengthwise through this log. The opening in the large end was seamed to about six inches in diameter, while the small end was trimmed down to about six inches from outside to outside. Strong iron bands were then put on the large end, and the small end of another log was forced into the large end of the first log. The second log was driven into the first with a sort of battering ram, such as we have used to bombard the large hickory trees to knock off nuts in the fall of the year. These wooden pipes were laid from the spring or well to the furnace, 
which was often three to five miles away the pipe lines are said to have been always straight and went over hills and across creeks however the country is comparatively level when the pipes crossed the creeks they weighted the pipes to the bottom of the stream with large castings in the general form of a horseshoe these were straddled over the logs and are said to have weighed two hundred and fifty to three hundred pounds all the pipes made prior to 1850 were made by hand but about 1850 or probably a little later they were bored by horsepower as said before the pipe line took a straight line from the well to the furnace at the well a pump or rather an elevator was rigged up a continuous belt with flat buckets riveted to it this crude elevator raised the water ten twenty or thirty feet as needed and thence it flowed down an upright pipe which connected at the bottom with the regular pipeline i was not able to determine whether or not there were relay stations but i am inclined to think there were the cisterns where these elevators were located were called heisting cisterns the fact that this piping system was in use in an early day has led to some errors with regard to wells some people living in those regions have thought there was a well wherever there was a furnace and the old furnaces are thick all over the country this is not the case there were few wells but the piping system carried the water in all directions the two chief places where wells were sunk were at the nigger spring and at half moon lick it has been estimated that one hundred miles of pipe was laid from eighteen hundred to eighteen seventy three the first wells were probably square and were twenty feet in diameter and about sixty feet deep they were walled up with logs all the old wells as they appear today are circular and are about twenty to twenty-five feet in diameter and from four to ten feet deep with sloping sides the water rose in these wells to within a few feet of the top of the ground in what may be called the middle period of salt making pipes were sunk in the bottom of these wells and a stronger brine secured timothy gard who was connected with salt making as early as eighteen sixteen and as late as eighteen thirty or later dug a deep well near the half moon lick perhaps as late as eighteen twenty five the well was dug down some sixty feet and walled up and then a boring was made in the bottom of this well a very fine quality of brine was thus secured and guard's well is a very noted place though few could point out the exact spot a large tree is growing on the inner margin of this well its banks are grassy and water stands in it some six feet below the surface of the ground this well was used till about eighteen fifty four about this time a company was formed consisting of stephen r rowan andrew mcallen chalen gard abner flanders broughton temple and joseph j castle they made preparation to manufacture salt on a more extensive scale than ever before they sunk another deep well at great expense and expended so much money that the company broke up and castle and temple eventually became the owners of the grounds and improvements these two men proceeded to complete the preparations for the manufacture of salt large boilers engines and pumps were installed large boiler iron evaporating pans were placed over the furnaces instead of the kettles these pans were from twelve to twenty feet wide and extended from the grates to the smokestack a distance of sixty or seventy feet there were three such rows of pans all connected with the same smokestack the old pans are lying there now in the weeds and brush i calculated their area and found they covered about three thousand square feet the pans were from ten to twelve inches deep coal had been discovered in a nearby hill and it was substituted for wood 
a tramway was built from the coal mine to the furnaces the water or brine was pumped from the deep wells to the top of the thorn house this thorn house was a frame structure resembling in general appearance the false work used in constructing a bridge across a small river it was twenty or thirty feet wide at the bottom and extended sixty feet high narrowing toward the top this would be the end view it extended some 150 or 175 feet in length. There were quite a number of cross beams, ties, and braces, and the whole inner space was filled with bundles of thorn bushes. These bundles of thorn bushes were carefully packed in the framework in such a way that all space was completely filled with them. These thorn bushes were found in great quantities all about the works on top of this thorn house running its entire length was a trough full of small holes the brine was pumped into this trough and allowed to flow gently to the other end and if it did not trickle through the holes on the first trip it was guided into another trough and caused to flow down it till all had passed through the openings in the bottom of the trough this brine now trickled through the thorn faggots to the bottom of the structure where it was caught in a large trench and conveyed to a large retaining basin this thorn house was a great mystery to the infrequent visitors to the salt works there are two explanations of its office in salt making one that the brine in passing from the top of the structure to the bottom lost by evaporation forty per cent of the water this was a great saving of fuel and labor in the boiling process another explanation of its use was this in evaporating the brine by boiling the water there were deposits of some substance like gypsum at the bottom of the pan which adhered to the bottoms of the pans and if not often removed would prevent the passage of the heat from the fire to the water and thus the pans would be burned now the thorn bushes were supposed to have the power to crystallize this foreign matter and thus purify the brine this plant was owned and operated by temple and castle from about eighteen fifty four to eighteen seventy three they are said to have made five hundred bushels of salt every twenty four hours in about 1873, Temple and Castle constructed a very complete plant a mile away at the coal mine, thinking it cheaper to move the water to the coal than the coal to the water. The plant was an expensive one, and when everything was nearly ready for work, hard times came on, salt became cheap, and the new works were never put into operation. In course of time, the machinery was removed and little is left to mark the new plant on december eighteenth nineteen o three i visited this region i spent four days in gathering up the facts concerning this great industry of a former age it was a pleasant task mr a d blankenship a former student in the normal was kind enough to furnish me a conveyance and accompany me in my investigations on reaching equality i was fortunate to make the acquaintance of messrs moore druggists who are very much interested in preserving the story of early days about their town mr harry moore accompanied me to the old works the ground is quite level and subject to overflow the day was an ideal spring day and as i stood on the spot where for three-fourths of a century a great industry flourished I had a strange feeling. It was deathly still. There were no noises, no bird songs, no cattle, no life. A mile away we could hear the noise of the village, a passing train, and the noise about the coal mine and coke ovens. We soon came to the cinder roads, and then we knew we were near the furnaces. Now and then we passed an old well. We had a camera, and we took views of wells, pans, 
thorn bushes etc we found the old furnaces the outlines of the old pans are still to be seen one old pan is quite well preserved but it will soon be moulded back to earth whence it came we found the old retaining cistern and found the location of the old residence of temple and castle about a quarter of a mile away we visited the noted half moon lick this is some one half quarter long and half quarter wide at the widest part it is about twenty or twenty five feet deep and is destitute of any growth except some willows and tufts of grass this lick is supposed to have been the resort of wild animals for centuries past the teeth and bones of mastodons have been found here we got a fairly good view of this lick the afternoon i spent with mr mcavoy a very intelligent and courteous old gentleman who came to equality about eighteen fifty five mr mcavoy is a friend of mr temple and is in possession of much valuable information which he has gathered in the last half century the second day i visited the nigger well four miles below equality and across the river from the town there was a downpour of rain this day which prevented me from making a close study of this region however i was able to find the exact spot the nigger spring which was salt and is the one evidently just used the sulphur spring which i found very strong and was evidently formerly in use for the old timbers are still to be seen embedded in the mud and the fresh water spring not far away these are all described by colonel sellers as early as eighteen fifty four just to the right as you go down the river towards the southeast is a high range of hills and at the nigger well the bluffs come close to the river and it is just up on these bluffs where colonel sellers used to find the indian graves and evidences of a village a few yards below the springs i found a native to the manor born he had lived in that immediate vicinity for fifty years and seemed a little surprised to think anyone would attach any importance to these old salt springs he told me that in a little bottom field just in front of his house and lying just below the springs that he had ploughed up bushels of broken pottery and that the whole field seemed to be one big furnace i asked him if any salt had been made there within the last fifty years and he said that everything looked just as it did fifty years ago i examined carefully the trees and i am very sure there are many of them three feet in diameter and yet colonel sellers affirms that in an early day every stick of timber was cut off for fuel i learned from the native above referred to that there was an old pipeline running from the springs near to an old furnace down the creek but across from his house and he said he was sure the old kettles were there yet but said they were covered up in the dirt but he was sure they could be found he said further that another line of pipe led to a furnace further down the river this line may have led to weeds works which were one half mile below the island ripple i visited shawnee town and spent considerable time with mr charles carroll whom i found to be a very pleasant gentleman he is probably the best informed man in shawnee town on early gallatin county history i spent some time in the recorder's office verifying some facts which i had gathered elsewhere incidentally i took one occasion to visit the old flag said to have been carried in the revolutionary war by general pavey i also viewed for a few moments the old brick house in which general lafayette was entertained this is called the rollins house finally i viewed with no little interest the humble home in which illinois greatest soldier and our honored guest today were married general and mrs juno a logan the third day in company with mr mcavoy mr mcintyre mr bunker and mr smith i visited again the old salt works on the outskirts of equality this second visit was very profitable 
for mr mcintyre was from a boy an employee about the works and most of the time in the capacity of cooper mr mcintyre knew every foot of the ground and with his help i drew a map locating every important place of interest about the grounds on this day in company with dr gordon and mr mcavoy i called to see uncle peter white colored now seventy years old uncle pete was brought up in the immediate vicinity of the salt works when he was ten years old he and three other children were kidnapped and taken into arkansas and sold he was afterwards rescued by watt white uncle peter's memory is good and i gathered some valuable information from him on the fourth day i visited the elliott family previously referred to and also the rev samuel westbrook now living in el dorado mr westbrook was born in eighteen o nine he came to johnson county in eighteen twelve and in eighteen twenty six he came to equality and began laboring in various capacities in the salt making business he was among other things a teamster he had lived in the immediate vicinity of the salt works for the past seventy-eight years and has a very vivid picture of most of the incidents which occurred within that period the men and women who have lived in this region from a very early day are very few and their ranks are thinning every day in a few years there will be none living whose lives cover the period of salt making and so far as i have been able to find out little if anything has ever been written and printed of this great industry of southern illinois end of the sailings of southern illinois by george w smith from the transactions of the illinois state historical society 1904 read for librivox by sue anderson when the dew falls from the book water wonders every child should know little studies of dew frost snow ice and rain by jean m thompson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org everything shone with the dewdrops that sparkled and trembling lay scattered to left and to right and the webs of the spiders were hung thickly with pearls and diamonds light in the wind they swung one of the most interesting and instructive phenomena in the lessons of nature is the falling of the dew a seeming miracle which begins with the setting of the sun and goes on mysteriously collecting and distributing its countless exquisite water jewels all through the long stillness of the night only to be dispelled again by the heat of the rising sun we are more or less familiar through casual observation with the varied beauties of the dew a walk in the country or park in the early midsummer morning just after the sun has risen if possible will enable you fully to appreciate its charms especially if the dew fall during the preceding night has been a copious one every bit of plant life and vegetation will sparkle and twinkle in the early sunshine hung and embellished with millions of glittering jewels the very smallest grass blade you will discover has not been neglected by the dew fairy and even the delicate gossamer-like spider's web swung from twig to twig or caught among the grasses is dew laden and an object of beauty well worthy of consideration happy indeed are you if you have enjoyed a stroll in an old-fashioned country flower garden in the early morning no need to dwell upon its charms if you have enjoyed that pleasure for you will long remember the refreshment and peace which came to you with the close companionship of the great pink damask roses their petals still heavy with the night dews the tall sentinel-like lilies cool and fragrant their cups filled with dewy nectar 
which great blundering bees were eagerly plundering clean smelling flocks waist high each velvet cluster moist and bent with its weight of dew then the beds of gray green mignonette and the best of all down in an out-of-the-way corner a tangle of unobtrusive old-fashioned pinks where you knelt and buried your face for a moment to inhale their spicy fragrance and found them doubly sweet and satisfying after their drenching dew bath while the beds of simples and humbler things the sage and wormwood with their silvery leaves heavy with dew exhaled a pungent aromatic odor as you brushed them in passing for the dew had refreshed them and enhanced their dormant spiciness tenfold the phenomenon of the dew is simply explained and well worthy of a short study as it is really a most important factor in nature's laws simply explained the dew is really an actual deposit of water from the atmosphere upon the surface of the earth and is formed when the earth is sufficiently cooled during the night by radiation upon a pleasant day during summer especially if the sun shines brightly much aqueous vapor or mist is held suspended in the air and if the temperature at sunset falls below the dew point that vapor can no longer be retained in suspension in the air and falls to the earth the dew is the vapor of the air sometimes it can readily be seen falling in a fine mist resembling rain it is the humidity of the air deposited upon all surfaces of the earth with which it comes in contact when the temperature falls below the dew point or thirty two degrees the dew then becomes converted into frost and we have a deposit of hoar frost instead of the dew it has been remarked that horizontal and flat surfaces exposed to the dew receive a greater deposit than sheltered or oblique surfaces dew has frequently been quoted as a shower from heaven but this is not literally correct true it appears rather mysteriously from a clear sky and upon a still cloudless night covers thickly every blade of grass and plant life with seeming raindrops and that frequently where rain clouds rarely appear and the rain seldom falls in such climates where a rainfall is rare it is certainly a most beneficial and wise provision for it gathers upon all herbage and vegetation in sparkling refreshing profusion while it avoids instinctively all barren rocky formations and all things which could not be benefited by its grateful cooling moisture also in cold damp climates where the air is constantly saturated with moisture and where an additional amount is not required the gathering clouds and the dampness of the chilly atmosphere prevent a radiation of heat from the earth and the dew never falls in such climates there are three requisites which appear to be essential for the formation of the dew first that the air should be moist second that the surface upon which it falls shall be cold and third that the sky be clear of course the atmosphere always contains a greater amount of moisture after a rainfall when the air has been greatly cooled evaporation is then continually going on among all objects lying near the surface of the earth blades of grass and all plants near the ground gradually cool and assume a lower temperature after sunset they are preparing for the fall of the dew it has been remarked that certain plants possess greater powers of radiating heat and of expelling moisture through evaporative process than others upon such plants the dew deposit is always more profuse while those plants possessing little powers of radiation and evaporation collect little dew there are very many plants whose leaves are downy with a thick growth of tiny vegetable hairs 
the mullen leaf is a good example its thick velvety leaves are thickly covered with this growth of vegetable down and present a velvety surface these leaves always collect a fine display of dew jewels one has been caught by the camera perched upon the down of a mullen leaf as shown in the photographic illustration during still nights in early spring and fall when there are no disturbing winds the water molecules or dew drops in countless numbers form one upon another all night long and settle upon blades of grass and all growing plants and in the morning sunshine dance and sparkle in strings of scintillating diamonds from every pasture and hedgerow the sharp pointed grasses collect the dew very copiously and in a most interesting manner dewdrops formed upon the grass blades it will be observed are arranged in a truly wonderful symmetrical fashion and one marvels at the orderly arrangement frequently one large dewdrop clear as a diamond is deposited upon the very tip of the little grass blade sometimes two and even three large drops are held in suspension thus while upon the extreme sharp edge of one or both sides of the blade a collection of small bead-like drops cling in orderly precise fashion strung from tip to root of the grass blade a broken or blunted blade of grass collects no dew or very little when the large dewdrop perched upon the tip of the grass blade decides to fall it descends rather slowly at first following the extreme edge of the blade in its course and thus meets and collects all the other dewdrops which it encounters strung along the edge of the blade until forming at last one heavy drop it suddenly falls to earth where it is instantly absorbed and goes to give life and strength to the very roots of the plant cobwebs attract the dew in a rather singular manner it is yet to be discovered why the dewdrops form only upon the horizontal threads of a spider's web while the vertical threads though smaller collect no dew deposit this curious fact is well shown in the photograph of the entire spider's web also in the section of a web showing the dew deposit in detail wonderfully beautiful are these dew laden webs it will be observed that each drop is similar in size and closely resembles several strings of well-matched pearls although in the sunshine they appear as clear flashing diamonds certain leaves collect the dewdrops in a novel manner notably the strawberry leaf and similar plants having serrate edges the strawberry leaf besides being plentifully decorated upon its surface with water beads holds in each tiny serration about its edge a large clear sparkling dewdrop which gives the leaf a wonderful jeweled effect we are all familiar with the so-called sweating of a glass or pitcher or a metal pipe containing cold water this is another phase of the dew and may be observed in the daytime a cool night in spring or autumn after a hot day we usually receive a more copious fall of dew which gradually increases as the night becomes cooler should clouds gather the precipitation of the dew at once ceases wherever a bush or bit of vegetation overhangs a spot it has a similar effect to that of a cloud and the dew does not collect at all or not as copiously in that spot in the tropics and in certain countries where there are no rain clouds where they rarely have rain for many months at a time the dewfall is so heavy that it quite supplies the lack of rainfall if it were not for this providential visitation of the dew all vegetable life must certainly perish scorched and withered by the torrid heat in the east in the region of palestine the dew frequently is so heavy that it closely resembles rain 
upon the great burning deserts alone the dew never falls for the moment the dew vapors or molecules encounter the scorching breath which arises from the face of these barren seas of sand they evaporate and are redissolved dissipated and consumed by the heat so it will be seen that the fixed molecules which compose vegetation alone have the power to attract and arrest the water molecules of the air with which they come in contact and thus form in combination the dew when the temperature is below thirty two degrees the tiny particles which go to form the dew become hoar frost it is often a great value to the farmer or vegetable grower to be able to know just the temperature of the dew point because if he discovers it in time he is enabled to save his garden from a sudden blighting visitation of the frost another interesting fact and one which is known to few of us but which may readily be seen if we take time to study the dewdrop minutely is that each tiny drop of dew is in itself a miniature mirror for upon its clear crystal-like surface it holds and faithfully portrays upon its rounded form the image of any nearby object the picture is of course naturally inverted but you will find it a bit of blue sky holding a scrap of fleecy cloud or a pygmy forest of trees caught and mirrored in the dewdrop often sleeping and dormant insects when caught out in the open during the night receive a copious deposit of dew the caterpillar shown in the photograph was a good subject and quite a collection of dew was deposited upon his furry coat nature in all her moods and they are many is always entertaining and instructive and perhaps one of her greatest marvels is that which takes place in the silence of the brooding night the falling of the gentle dew and of when the dew falls from the book water wonders every child should know little studies of dew frost snow ice and rain by jean m thompson read for librivox by sue anderson